great what happened So uh, I am trying to fix up the history of Great Green Revolution and the future of amazing Gene Revolution. So why Green Revolution and Gene Revolution? Of course, for the security of food for all of you. So when we are talking about the food security in US, <coughs> twenty people spend less than twenty percent of their income on their food. In poor part of Asia and Africa. This increased to 50 to 75 percent, and when price increase, food become unavailable. So when I, we are talking about the foods price, I went to Turkey in 2006. The price of one bread it was 25 kurosh, and now it is five lira. It means in Turkey prices increased 20 times in last 10 years. Same thing happening in Pakistan. Rising of food price and unemployment causes food insecurity. Earthquake and deforestation in Haiti, drought and ongoing civil wars in Sudan, and drought and poor government in Kenya, all these factors affect the food security and food availability. Beside of these factors, the one of the biggest driest of the history, climate change. Population is going to increase, resources going to decrease, and the scenario of climate change, all these affect the food security. For this, we need something to do. So breeding could be the one of the most promising approach. Uh, not only food security, of course, the quality of food to eliminate hidden hunger. Yesterday, people talk about this. So plant breeders, actually plant breeders succeeded in developing varieties with high yield. And this increase in the yield, about 50% due to agronomy mean fertilization, irrigation, pest management, and 50% of the genetics. When we talk about the agronomy, most of the agricultural practices are set up in most of the crops, but still we have something to do with genetics. It means we should talk about the breeding and the revolutions again. So when we talk about the history of revolutions, you see, uh, around 10,000 years before, people were living in the caves. And at that time, people were selecting some foods according to his taste preference. This conscious and unconscious selections resulted in the domestication of the most of the crops that we use in our kitchen today. And this domestication scenario actually was a revolution that we call as Neolithic revolution. And this happened 10,000 years before. When we came in the near history, you are seeing this guy, introduction of nitrogenous fertilizers, increase the wheat yield in India, Pakistan, Turkey, and most part of the world, and also increase the lodging. This guy suddenly went to the Japan and found a wheat cultivar Norin and introduced developing gene in Mexican wheat. And through Mexico, developing genes spread to whole of the world. Introduction of nitrogenous fertilizers plus dwarfing gene resulted in the wheat yield in most part of the world. And this guy was awarded a Nobel Prize for peace. Why peace? To eliminate hunger and for food security. This was what we call as Green Revolution. So when we came in today, all of us, we believe that population is going to increase, resources going to decrease, and scenario of climate change, we need an, an other green revolution. And this new revolution could only be possible with the new approaches of genomics, biotechnology. Yesterday, Dr. Shah said, uh, silent revolution, I don't believe. It is going to be a second green revolution and it will be very noisy revolution. I will talk uh, some aspects of molecular markers and genomics in my current projects. So what do you think? Does biotechnology and genomics can help to eliminate hunger? I think, let's see. So in 2020, Nobel Prize was given for introduction of genome editing. Of course, genome editing revolutionized in molecular biology, but of course, genome editing in single is nothing. 
we have to go in a multidisciplinary way. Multidisciplinary approach can help to revolutionize breeding for future food security. So far, breeding, we need to talk about the diversity. Yesterday, I'm going to talk too much about diversity. I will skip <laughs> slides. Uh, before COVID, we make a uh, workshop in southeastern Turkey with IPK Gatarlasman and Cambridge University with Chokorova University and we visited southeast of Turkey. These are the original pictures that we were taken. And when you go there in the mountain, there are hundreds of thousands of the land races, natural populations of wheat, chickpea, lentil, barley, and you can see the treasure of diversity there. So when we are talking about the diversity, you see this is a map of fertile crescent. This is the area that originated from northern Iran, southeastern Turkey, Jordan, Palestine, Syria, and what you can say, soil. This is the area where most of the crops that we use in our kitchen today is originated and domesticated. And Turkey actually is in the center of this fertile crescent. It's mean it is a hot and rich spot of the wild diversity. So that is why this area called as the cradle of agriculture. So Turkey actually not only the origin and domestication center of most of the crop, due to geopolitical and geographic position of Turkey that is connecting Asia, Europe, and Africa. Since ancient time, maize, potatoes, beans, these are not originated in Turkey. But we can see that there is a plentiful diversity in beans and maize. For example, I will give one example. In Germany, Germans call maize as a grano de turco, Turkish wheat, mean. It means in Germany, maize was introduced from Turkey. Crops which are not originating in Turkey, still, this is a center of more, all uh, diversity center of these crops, even. So, uh, crop politics, wild relatives. For breeding, for biotech stress, abiotic stress, under climate change scenario, we need crop wild relatives. And again, Turkey is a center of most of the wild relatives of chickpeas, wheat, barley, etc. So, when we are talking about the breeding, we need to cross parents. We are developing F1, F2 progenies. We have thousands of plants. And we have thousands of progeny and we need to screen for whatever we are screening. And this is a time consuming laborious and it's need money as well. And it's take a lot of time to develop a cultivar. So under increasing this scenario, this approach cannot be effective. So what plant breeder was doing after green revolution, he was selecting plants based on only his visual observations. But now we need to do something efficient. So in molecular breeding, you are again crossing parents, susceptible parents, resistant parents, developing F1, F2 progenies, and et cetera. If you have molecular marker, for example, you can see that this arrow show that if this band is present, plant is resistant to particular disease or particular trait. So you can select and throw rest of them. This can consume, uh, save your time, labor, expertise, etc., and increase your efficient selection. So uh, for molecular markers, we need some genomic resources. With the sequencing of human genome project in 2000 and sequencing of Arabidopsis Ar Ar thaliana in those time, most of the crops of agriculture and produce have been sequenced. In 2018, wheat, which is the most of the complex gen genome, three, four times bigger than the human genome is got sequenced in 2013. In 2013, our genome sequencing project started. It means every organism which is present on the earth is going to be sequenced with multi collaboration and multi laboratories. So what will this do? This will produce a very big data. Reference genomes, pan genomes, and many in silico data which can be used in the next few years for most of the crops of agriculture and for tens for breeding perspective. So I will give you an example in a speedy way because we ha I have very less time. So how we can use molecular marker in crop breeding? Gen plasm discrimination. 
you can use molecular marker effectively in germ plasma discrimination. For example, in our recent study that we published this year, just few months before, we use <coughs> hundreds of durum wheat, Turkish cultivars, foreign cultivars, uh, growing land races, and the land races which are preserved in the gene banks. And we use thousands of SNP and bar markers, and you can see all of the foreign cultivars and Turkish cultivars separately. Growing land races and gene bank races again separated. And when you check this data with a degree, it was 100% correct. We can get more information uh, from this article that we published in Crop Science just a few months before. And another project that we are running today, uh, we are using molecular marker for heterosis breeding in maize. We use around 100,000 SMPs for identification of heterotic groups in maize. And we use, you can see, different colors. All different colors show that different heterotic group. Uh, Flint, Lancaster, stiff stock, and iodine. When you are going to start for heterosis or hybrid breeding in maize, you can use the genotype from different groups to get maximum heterosis. And this project is going on, funded by Tubitak. And, and other my European projects that is just currently I'm uh, leading with the participation of France, Belgium, Italy, Spain, Denmark, and Turkey, we have around uh, 300 sorghum assistants and we are screening them under limiting condition of water and nitrogen and are trying to identify the best genotype suited under these conditions. And we resequence this panel of accession and we have around 13 terabytes uh, data of resequencing of all of these sorghum lines. And you can see this sequences data how clearly discriminated the sorghum bicolor and the lines of sorghum bicolor and helper sacrosis. So we are going to identify SNPs from this resequencing data and using them for GWAS analysis, for physiological and agronomic traits, as well as biochemical traits. And later we are going to validate markers and developing class markers. And the first paper is published just now in scientific report. Uh, this is another current running project uh, in tomato. We have around 450 lines and we are screening the potato or, uh, tomato lines under drought condition, mean 50% feed capacity, and trying to uh, identify the best promising lines of tomato and doing GWAS analysis for physiological and agronomic, as well as iron and zinc. And this project is funded by Turkish Agriculture Ministry and uh, with collaboration of one private company, United Genetics. Uh, molecular market can be used in identification origin of the crops. For example, rice. Turkey is not origin of the rice. Uh, but we use two different types of molecular markers and check that how these molecular markers, uh, how rice is originated in Turkey. So using these two markers, we see that Turkey has a relationship with Italy and France. It means in Turkey, rice is originated from Italy or France. Paper was published in and uh, you can use molecular marker in taxonomic classification as well. Uh, here we use six Y, five Y, and one cultivated species, and use retrotoxicosomes markers. And you can see that all of the species clearly discriminated. And you can also find the close species with the cultivated species, and you can use them in your crossing program for genetic enhancement for the traits what you want. So this paper was published in Biochemistry and Biotechnology. Marker resistance selection, you can see here example of dwarfing gene. This band show the dwarfing alleles, the upper one, the tall allele. So you can select efficiently for this gene for, uh, using molecular markers. Here, uh, there is RSPA gene that is also dwarfing gene and affected in Mediterranean condition. This uh, gene has close link SSR marker. So we use this SSR marker and we have identified that some cultivar have 192 base pair allele, which is associated with RST8 gene. So uh, we published this paper in plant genetic resources. This is another case of viralization gene. 
you can find that uh, this band and this band where one of the session you required and where you did not require paper was published in serial research communication i am going speedily because i have no time uh, this is a, one of the most recent study you can see we use cas markers for identification of the duno wheat lines with cadmium uptake and you can see that high cadmium genotype in the grain and low cadmium genotype or grain are clearly discriminated with an efficient way and we validated them with the biochemical analysis as well the marker was 100% efficient and paper was published in crop and process science uh molecular marker could be used for tutorial mapping as well so uh, we make a cross of durum uh, wheat land races one is from turkey and one is from syria and make recombinant embryo lines and identified qtls for zinc and iron and this paper was published in molecular biology report in another study we are developed ssr markers in lentil identified the chromosomal position by genetic mapping and validated them in diversity analysis paper was published in plant breeding and association mapping you can also identify qtl through you know what association mapping uh, here we use common bean joint plasm making some field experiment at different location making gbs analysis and later we perform bioinformatics analysis for zinc iron and biofortification of biochemical traits here two three examples we identified the chromosomal region uh, for magnesium you people working on the zinc and iron magnesium also a organic element we identified some marker and this marker was efficient in all of the environment and could be a candidate marker paper was published in frontier this is another study where we find uh, a molecular marker for protein content in uh, bean and you can find information in our article this is another study for anti accident activity in bean and you we also identified some molecular marker linked with anti accident capacity in bean and paper was published in gene this is the uh, genotypic vari phenotypic variation for selenium in cisem and paper in food composition and analysis yes so if we have identified the link markers you need to validate those marker after validating you can use them in breeding program so this is the last example uh and with most of the molecular markers are developed and many cross markers are available in wheat for example virulization gene dwarfing gene protein content zinc and iron and many other traits so uh, we screened 292 cultivars of bread wheat and identified 180 markers using cas technique and develop a database uh, for different genes of interest in bread wheat uh, and also develop a molecular database of bread wheat in turkey so this is the last uh, slide last step of slide uh, for genomic selection for genomic selection you are need to develop a training population you are genotyping phenotyping and developing model uh, for your training population and for through this training population you are do using prediction model in your breeding population and you can efficiently select the parents and you can use them in your breeding program one of article uh, on genomic selection and sorghum just recently published in genes uh, for jivas analysis and qtl as most of the work there are thousands of publications in jivas and qtl but most of the articles are failed because of the phenotyping error so high throughput phenotyping could be an efficient way so if you have high throughput phenotyping high throughput genotyping and bioinformatics analysis you can go for genomic selection so uh, we have thousands of the germplasm of soybean wild soybean sesame peanut common bean maize so let's come to join us for more collaboration using this germplasm so if all of us work in a combined way all together so i hope we can get big spike like this in near future and i would like to acknowledge european commission to be tag turkish agriculture ministry and all of the universities who supported me thank you for your patience
Thank, really? you very, thank you very much, Dr. Fahim. We, we shall have a question uh, at the end of this session. Okay. So, Morning. I would like to invite Zahid, Dr. Zahid Muftar to give a lecture on development genetically modify insect resistance cotton. Sorry about my reading. It was too dark. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Comsec and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. So I'll be talking on development of genetically modified uh, insect resistant cotton. So I'll uh, skip some of the slides because you already know the importance of cotton in Pakistan. So there are some uh, actually factors. We have seen uh, a downward trend in cotton production in Pakistan of, uh, for the last few years. So the, there are many reasons for this. There are some uh, biotech factors, abiotic factors, and other factors which include non-availability of quality seed, fertilizers, high input costs, and low market prices for the raw cotton for the farmers. So this all has led to a downward trend in cotton production in Pakistan. Uh, there are uh, different methods for crop improvement. This includes the conventional breeding, molecular breeding, genetic engineering, and genome or uh, gene editing technology. So conventional breeding, as you know, is the most obvious choice uh, for crop improvement, but it, it depends on uh, uh, the genes which are available in the uh, uh, breeding population. Uh, molecular breeding can significantly reduce the time and effort required for variety development as you can uh, observe different traits at very early stage. Uh, genetic engineering on the other hand provides uh, an unlimited pool of genetic variability which can be exploited as genes from different organisms can be cloned and used for crop improvement. Now, uh, we are uh, working on uh, different uh, trades at NIPTI, like uh, cotton leaf curl disease resistance, insect resistance, abiotic stress tolerance, herbicide tolerance, and fiber improvement. But I will limit my talk uh, uh, at the insect resistance. So genes uh, being used for development of insect resistant transgenic cotton include Bt toxins. Uh, these are all synthetic genes in indigenously developed at NIPTI. Uh, that include Cry1AC, Cry2AB, and VIP3A. Similarly, plant lectins, we have isolated uh, these lectins from uh, lectin genes from onion and color grass. And a uh, novel uh, technology which we have developed at NIPG is a neurotoxin uh, developed from uh, spiders. Now, why a wild type? BT genes, they uh, don't uh, express at uh, an optimum level. So uh, scientists have worked out, basically it's the, uh, there are different reasons for this. Like uh, there is a codon bias in the, uh, if you uh, select genes from a bacteria system and try to express in a plant system. So there is a codon bias due to which genes express poorly and uh, uh, in the plant system. So we have to remove that bias. So there are certain approaches which can be used to maximize the gene expression. So this include use of truncated genes, uh, fully modified genes, which in which we make uh, changes in the codons or which we call uh, codon optimization. Then use of tissue specific promoters and uh, ultimately we can also use uh, organelle transformation like chloroplast transformation, where hundreds of copies of the gene can be expressed per cell. 
Now, uh, synthetic genes are actually fully modified, codon optimized, and uh, messenger RNA destabilizing sequences, they are removed. And uh, the, these are cloned in the suitable plant expression uh, uh, regulatory signals to achieve higher expression. No, first, uh, once we developed these uh, synthetic genes, we characterized them in a model plant system uh, because it is easy, easy to transform high transformation efficiency. Transgenic plants can be recovered within 10 to 12 weeks and molecular and physiological characterization can be made easily. And for this, we use tobacco as a model system. Uh, these are some of the genes that have been used uh, to develop insect resistance in uh, cotton. This include HVT, which is a spider toxin, Cryon ac and then a combination of HVT with lactin, Cryon ac Cry2AB, and VIP3A. And uh, some of the uh, genes, uh, the combinations we have developed, it, it is already in the field. So HVT gene, basically it's an Australian funnel web spider gene. Uh, a study was conducted in uh, Australia where uh, they have characterized this venom uh, from the Australian spiders. Uh, and from that, we picked up the idea that this can be used for insect resistance in plants. So it's venom has a complex cocktail of insecticidal proteins which can, be tar which can target vertebrate as well as invertebrate nervous systems. So one of the toxins, which is omega ecotoxin HB1A, it specifically uh, targets the nervous system of the invertebrate calcium channels, basically. So this toxin shows insecticidal activity against the larvae of butterflies and uh, moths. And this gene was uh, patented uh, in 2004 by NIPG. So this was the first patent of NIPG. So we actually, uh, reverse, uh, made a reverse engineering. We had the information about the protein. So we back translated into uh, uh, DNA sequence. And this uh, synthetic gene was uh, cloned in a plant transformation vector as well as in a bacterial system for expression. So we have used uh, these two uh, uh, parallel pathways for expression of these uh, uh, toxin in bacteria as well as in plants. So as I uh, uh, told you that we first expressed this in a tobacco and you can see that this, this is a cotton ball worm and this is against the army worm. And these are the uh, whole insect biases conducted on the whole plants. You can see the insect uh, uh, is damaging the leaves. Whereas these are the uh, activity expressing uh, tobacco plants, and these are the detailed leaf biases with the uh, Ricoverpa armigera, which is called the Volta. And this was uh, published in uh, Transgenic Research in 2006. So as you can see that uh, some of the lines, they exhibited a very high efficiency of expression uh, uh, and the insect mortality was observed within 48 hours, 100% insect mortality was observed. In. 20, uh, 48 hours. And uh, you can see the uh, gain of weight at zero and 72 hours. So in the control, you can see the, the weight gain and the weight reduction in the uh, transgenic lines. Now, can HVT uh, target pink ball worms? So it was not tested until recently because HVT cotton plants were neither exposed to natural conditions nor uh, weird insect of pink bollworm were available. So however, recent success in wearing pink bollworm made it possible to test HVT cotton uh, for uh, resistance against pink bollworm. And we found that it targets uh, pink bollworm effectively and 100% mortality in the pink bollworm was observed. So our transgenic lines uh, we introduced uh, this uh, millibug on the transgenic plants. So we noticed that they kept on feeding on these plants. So there was actually no effect on uh, these uh, uh, millibugs. So 
from uh, this we concluded that uh, probably it was uh, expressed at low level in the cell sap. So we then uh, used flow specific promoters like sucrose synthase to express these genes in transgenic uh, tobacco. So uh, you can see that the transgenic lines, they were uh, having no uh, these uh, crawlers or and the introduced millibugs, they were killed within a few days. And these plants also targeted the uh, insects, which are the uh, Armigera. So uh, since it was a new gene, so we had uh, to do uh, very rigorous studies on its biosafety and risk assessment. So we use different uh, uh, to see its effect on non-target organisms and uh, we conducted a cure over toxicity, subchronic toxicity and blood, blood biochemistry, protein and lipid profiles. And then we also saw uh, effect uh, of HOT on soil water microflora ecosystem and effects on other plants. And uh, we found uh, in Amulla was our one uh, of our PhD students, he conducted uh, this uh, study, biosafety study on friendly insects. And there was no, uh, from this study, it was concluded that the protein had no toxic effects uh, on these non-target species belonging to the orders of Coleoptera, Neuroptera, and Amenoptera. So HUT might thus be an interesting candidate for developing insecticidal plant varieties to control lepidopteran pests. And we have also developed uh, some synthetic PT genes like this is uh, Cryo-1AC and uh, some of the lines express this Cryo-1AC at very high levels. Similarly, we have developed uh, uh, two gene uh, BT cotton. So, uh, these are the insect biocell and their expression on uh, immunostrips. And we have also characterized the event from uh, where these uh, uh, genes, they have landed in the uh, cotton uh, 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 this genome. So we now have available uh, these uh, uh, primers, which can specifically amplify the regions where these genes have been inserted in the genome. And you can see that uh, this is the amplified fragment uh, using these uh, fragments and the Monsanto event, which is quite commonly used all over the world, it is not being detected. So uh, the last uh, one is the VIP3A gene, which we have recently developed and it has been expressed in tobacco and ultimately transformed in cotton. So it also gives uh, around 87% uh, mortality against this uh, cotton bollworm. And we have also tested them with army worm and it is equally effective against army worm. So current scenario of transgenic uh, resistance buildup in insects demands the use of multiple two or three BT genes for effective and broad spectrum insect control. So HVT is a very effective molecule against major insect pests of cotton. And this assessment studies indicate that HVT is safe to deploy in transgenic plants for insecticidal control and does not target friendly insects. HVT can be used for insect resistance management once other technologies fail to provide effective insect control or it can be combined with BT or lectin genes for resistance, resistant pest management. So uh, there is a long list of acknowledgements. Uh, Dr. Shahid Mansoor, our director, is always behind us to support us uh, in the uh, different research activities. Uh, Dr. Shaheen Aftab, the famous iron lady at NIPGI, she is working on uh, cotton transformation. Uh, Dr. Aftab, she is our ex head. Uh, he has been instrumental in uh, uh, cloning these genes. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Said also was uh, involved in cloning. Dr. Imran Amin also involved in cloning. And uh, Dr. Asif is uh, involved in the characterization and uh, uh, this event characterization work. And Dr. Sarwar is uh, uh, he's involved in uh, insect rearing 
and do the biases. Harshad is also involved in uh, cotton transmission and number of uh, our PhD students, uh, lab fellows and researchers are involved in this activity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zahid, uh, this valuable talk and finishing on time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, next speaker is Dr. Masir Ahmed Said uh, from NIPT. Uh, he's deputy chief scientist there. He's going to talk about speed breeding. Uh, I am Dr. Nasir Said and uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, on this forum to present on speed breeding. Although my research area is all on the biotechnology, GM crops, but this, uh, this is a bridging uh, tool uh, that uh, today I will discuss. Uh, this is equally good for both uh, plant breeders and biotechnologists. So we can use this speed breeding technology uh, for uh, generation advancement uh, in all different types of uh, crops. Uh, so this is a new concept idea in plant research. And I hope you might be aware of this one, but today I will just give you an overview of this, what is speed breeding and how we can utilize it. So uh, I think I go, go to the next slide. So this presentation includes uh, some little introduction, then what is the genetic gain? People talk about this one, but today I will also explain what actually genetic gain and how we can achieve it. Then uh, what are those uh, light spectrums, LED grow lights? So then uh, some examples of uh, speed breeding of different crops and uh, then some challenges, then the take home message at the end, I have listed a number of references, so you can read them, uh, read those uh, uh, articles thoroughly. So if still you not clear, you can email me and I can guide you. So as have different speakers talk about the uh, growing, the challenges of feeding the people because the population is growing. So, but how we can achieve that one? So how we can breed uh, better varieties. So there are different technologies available and people are uh, just uh, experiencing those ones, including the simple, the conventional plant breeding, then different techniques of uh, uh, markers and uh, genomic selection, genome editing, this and that. So there are so many things. So, but this technique, which I'm going to do will be useful for everyone, okay? So uh, this is the just the overview because uh, for a plant breeder, because breeder is not just a scientist, it's also an art. Uh, so this is an art and science both together, but still you need uh, different resources to do this one, including the uh, your genetic diversity. Uh, and then you need uh, some equipment, labor, money, land, you need everything to get that genetic gain. So I will explain this equation in next slides. Uh, but just this is the overview of the uh, what we actually, uh, this is the potential effects of climate change that actually reduce the crop yield. So we fall here, but uh, actually this is what we want uh, in next uh, 30 years. Uh, so we have to improve the agronomy. We have to improve the breeding we have to improve the breeding cycle. So this actually speed breeding is uh, this not for farmers, it's actually a receptor tool. So we can, how we can achieve uh, uh, multiple generations per year uh, by just manipulating the light and temperature and like these things. So I think uh, this is the equation that actually uh, explain you what is the genetic gain. So this genetic gain, how we can improve this one, this is the one is selection intensity, then selection accuracy, then genetic variance. So if we work on three of these ones, we will improve the genetic gain. Plus another thing that is the time. So if we uh, in, uh, uh, reduce this one time period, so we will increase the genetic gain. 
so these are uh, actually uh, the uh, about the genetic variants but it, it is because uh, during the course of evolution we have lost some of the traits and uh, we are uh, actually uh, we have to look for new traits the other thing is that in, the, in this example this is a uh, old our land race of wheat and uh, with time now uh, we have this uh, with the dwarfing genes uh, we have uh, wheat uh, much modified one but with the time we have also lost the genetic variation that we have to recover so now i come to the, our topic where that is speed breeding speed breeding, speed breeding basically is the suit of techniques that involves the manipulation of environmental conditions under which crop genotypes are grown, aiming to accelerate flowering and seed set to advance the next breeding generation as quickly as possible. So actually we have to complete uh, more than um, one generation in a time. And uh, normally we get one, um, one cycle in one year, but with the help of shuttle breeding, we can do two generations per year. But with this technique, uh, the, we can speed up, we can shorten the breeding cycle and accelerate crop research to rapid generation advancement. So this is the technique actually. So this is this slide just show the history of uh, how this was evolved because uh, long time ago, people started growing plants under artificial lights. Then NASA uh, did some experiment in the space. Then with the discovery of these LED uh, lights, but the practical work started around 2000 uh, in, when people use these lights, but now this one is now in much advanced stage. We can grow different crops uh, by just manipulating their light and photo period. So uh, as you know, uh, there are two types of crops, not two, but three, but one is long day crops that flower when the day is longer. The other one is flower when the day is length is shorter. So by manipulation of this one, if we grow plants under longer day, longer days, so those plants will flower. So this technique has been optimized in all these crops. But with other, uh, this is the reverse story because you, you have to shorten the day length. So in this case, even in soybean and rice, you can uh, get uh, the flowers in short time. So this, this is just this graph shows that in case of uh, uh, longer days, if you uh, increase the photo period length, those plants will flower. The other in short days, the other way around. But in neutral, you can grow anytime and you can get flower at any time. So no problem. Uh, and uh, second thing is that you have to adjust the light intensity at the plant canopy. You need a light uh, of about uh, 400 to 500 micromole per meter square per second. So if you maintain this much light on the plant canopy, your plant will flower. And uh, with this technique, uh, you can get more generations of the crops. Uh, if you, in case of these crops like wheat, if you set a day length of 22 hours and a night of two hours, your plant will flower earlier and instead of three generations per year in under normal light you will get six so in this in, similarly in other crops like in barley chickpea these are all long days okay so this uh, technique of speed breeding even um, it could be more useful if you uh, combine it with other genomic selection techniques with genome editing and so instead of uh, completing your cycle in 12 years by normal breeding you, with double applied you can reduce two to three years but in speed breeding you can even reduce it to five to six years so this is the advantage that you complete the first few generations in a very short instead of two generations you will get four but this is the this is the standard things but for every specific crop this is even more, you can even short that one. So what we got from this one that uh, by using different uh, artificial grow lights, uh, we, can, we can shorten the breeding, breeding cycle up to five to six years. Uh, so I just give you the idea of the light because in our white light, there are seven different colors. When we pass this light through a prism, uh, you can see those colors. But uh, how we can utilize this information because in normal light, in our in our sun's uh, light, we get a spectrum of light like this. 
so but that all is not required by plant so we have to see which which uh, uh, color is useful for plant to grow faster so we don't need all those ones but there is a difference between a very bright light and the light which uh, is required for photosynthesis so uh, this is the spectrum range from 400 to 700 nanometer that actually we 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 need and we need specific spectrum only we we don't care about how bright your light so it's a difference between the lumen that the light we see is and the and the light which plant needs so in this picture i can just show you those spectrums if you want more vegetative growth in your spectrum you need more blue but if you need flowering you need more red in your spectrum so this is the two actually peaks show you this one this is actually essential for plant growth this is blue and this is the red spectrum so if these two colors are available so your plant will grow happily and faster so uh, there are a number of uh, um, these led grow lights available in the market if you go to alibaba you will find thousands of different uh, types and versions of these lights but here i will give you a very uh, success story the the lights produced by this helio uh, spectra uh, uh, that is actually a swedish company so you can adjust these peaks yourself so there is a, a adjustment and a, a very good one so there are many others but these weeds this this wheat has grown under these lights and uh, you can complete a weed cycle in 60 to 65 days this is grown under and this uh, grow lights led grow light and this is a normal one, normal one so there is a big difference so the other things that you have to uh, at, at optimize is the soil quality you have to use uh, vermiculite and mix and with the different fertilizers so there are few uh, optimized uh, recipes available because this technique was uh, initially uh, used at uh, uh, university of queensland in brisbane and i mean john in a center uk so they have uh, provided uh, these different soil mixes so you can grow your plant faster because when plant will grow fast it definitely require more nutrition so these are some of the examples uh, i have just taken from the literature and uh, because this uh, professor lee hickey that's working in queensland so they have uh, done a lot of work on these ones and uh, Uh, they have optimized these light condition for different crops from wheat barley in canola and chickpea so there are a variety of uh, information is available so um, if you want we can provide you and uh, these are other different crops like canola canola so there are many peas so uh, so i just summarize some of the these uh, in this list this is the The, on this side, these are the crops, some condition, and days to maturing, and number of generation. Even in case of Arabidopsis, you can see even you can get ten generations in one year. And for others, there are seven, eight, and if you if your system is efficiently working, you have a good greenhouse, so you can complete six to eight generations of different crops. and uh, other thing is that in this uh, in this whole procedure uh, in most of the crops we use a uh, uh, single seed descent method i think if there is pran beater sitting here they can understand what this single seed descent means so there are some advantages of using uh, this technology so i think uh, i will not go into detail and uh, and just to show you if if you are working on genome editing because this technique is equally good for everyone if you produce some genome edited plant here if you grow under this led grow light you will get seeds very fast in, instead of on under normal lights so it's it's equally effective for everyone so this slide shows uh, different technologies that can be that can benefit from speed breeding work so on the, from this discussion that we came to that there are only four factors that we have to control one is your light if you have leds of the space facility then you have to control the photo period then you have to control the temperature of the greenhouse and humidity these only four things are required so you can faster your speeding the breeding program so this greenhouse you can even 
do this one in a very small uh, cabinet or like this or you can do this in greenhouse so it depends upon you what facilities you are available so it's equally you can manipulate it yourself this is uh, speed breeding for long day crops this is for short day crops this is for soybean like uh, like crops which are otherwise difficult to grow even then you can handle those one just manipulating this uh, uh, the light spectrum so your your plants will flower so this uh, slide is taken from the cement uh, because they are using this facility for wheat breeding and uh, they are routinely working on that one that this slide is taken actually it's in pakistan this greenhouse is available in narc and we are also using that one for wheat and uh, we have advanced our generation there similarly at nigi we developed the similar condition at nigi and uh, we are doing that one there as well and uh, there are some challenges as well because you need some expertise to do this one you need some infrastructure you need some resources financial support so then you can do it so just the take home message is that this uh, this this technology can accelerate your research programs and uh, um, by uh, reducing the amount of time space resources invested in the selection genetic advancement so and uh, at the end i just put a list of all those uh, latest uh, references uh, that people have used these techniques uh, so you can read those ones otherwise you can write me so we will provide you the information thank you very much very much dr nasir uh, dr nasir may i borrow your slides yes sure thank you so much yes yes uh -huh. everyone can take i would like to invite uh, dr mukono kasim kasanovic from kazakhstan uh, he will give a talk on agricultural biotechnology and conservation of biodiversity in kazakhstan current studies and future prospects Good evening, dear participants. <coughs> My name is Kasim Mukanov. I am from National Biotechnology Center. I told you uh, some short information about our national center and uh, give you some review about uh, investigations last in, uh, in last time in area of agricultural biotechnology in conservation of bio uh, biodiversity. Uh, structure of National Center for Biotechnology. Uh, the main enterprises uh, located in uh, city Nur Sultan uh, in this, uh, And uh, we have two branches. Uh, one branches in Almaty uh, on the basis of central, central level uh, reference laboratory and branch uh, in city Stepnogorsk. And the private scientific analytical center biomed preparat in uh, city Stepnogorsk. Uh, structure and stuff of uh, NCB. Uh, NCB in uh, Nur Sultan comprises of uh, 14 laboratories. The names of this laboratory in the uh, in the presentation and staff number 290 persons. Uh, areas of research by uh, research of our center uh, were different uh, by medicine medical genetics and predictive medicine stem cell technology regenerative medicine and plant biotechnology and veterinary science and food and processing industry ecology bio uh, biogeotechnology 
uh, for the last time, our center uh, developed some tests for diagnosis of infectious diseases of animals. Uh, some of these ELISA, ELISA tests for diagnosis of brucellosis and mouse diseases, leptospirosis, leptospirosis rabies, and PCR tests for diagnosis of brucellosis, anaplasmosis, tailorosis, babesiosis, anthracis, chlamydiosis, lycosis, pastorellosis, and uh, campylobacteriosis. Immunochromatographic test for diagnosis of brucellosis and lycosis was registered and uh, introduced into veterinary laboratories. Advantages of immunochromatography test and then specificity of uh, this test up to uh, 100%, 100 uh, sensitivity, uh, three, five nanogram per milliliter, time of analysis, 10 minutes, and simplicity of analysis, no equipment requirement required. <coughs> Since uh, 2016 in Kazakhstan, genetic confirmation of origin is uh, mandatory for all tribal bulls producers. The National Center for Biotechnology carries out genotyping of cattle according to the recommended International Society of Animal Genetics uh, using uh, ester methods using uh, 15 mic uh, micro satellite locus and determine the identity of the calf's origin. Uh, since 2017, NCB implemented uh, grants creation of infra and infrastructure for genotyping and confirming the breed of livestock for the breeding uh, chambers and farmers of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Uh, for the last five years, uh, we have performed genotyping according to the uh, technology uh, 30, uh, 32,218 uh, uh, head of cattle from 450 farms, uh, breeds Hereford, Angus, Kazakh, White, Hidet, Aulikul, and Kalmyck breeds. New plants varieties using biotechnology methods uh, cell selection, embryo culture, and uh, gaploid biotechnology were created six varieties of spring wheat, which resistant to uh, black point seeds, uh, drought, uh, salinity, and potato, and one potato variety, uh, astenolic, which resistant to dry fusarium mold. In this uh, you see scheme for creating new varieties of wheat using uh, <coughs> biotechnological methods. The technology of certification and differentiation of wheat varieties, hybrids, and breeding lines by the methods of multiplex PCR has been developed. Genetic, uh, genetics passport for uh, 30 commercial wheat varieties of Kazakhstan, uh, Britain were created. We obtained to uh, patent for the methods of identification of varieties and the, the set of synth synthetic oligonucleotides for genotyping uh, lines and varieties of serial groups by the Arab methods. Uh, using the recombinant technology, we obtained strength producing of enzymes for the processing of agriculture products and animal feeding. Uh, Hemazine, fetides, amylase, uh, xylanase, protease. Uh, for example, recombinant camel hemazine used for milk coagulation. Uh, it's used in cheese making industry. Uh, is milk uh, coating enzyme uh, properties high activity on uh, sixty percent more than traditional enzymes can use for preparation cheese from maize milk. 
uh, recommended bacterial analyze used to uh, uh, hydrolyze starch used to obtain syrup from starch containing raw materials in uh, breathing a food additive properties high thermostability and high activity uh, recommended uh, bacterial fighters uh, hydrolyze fit, uh, fitats in plant and uh, liberated phosphorus use uh, on, on poultry farming uh, as enzyme additives uh, improve phosphorus utilization for feed reduce phosphorus content of animal feces uh, decompose anti-nutritional factors to release nutrients improve daily gain decrease feed conservation ratio and reduce feed cost Recommended bacterial xylanize. Hydrolyzed uh, <coughs> xylan uh, implant used in poultry farming as enzyme additives. The effects uh, destruction of xylan as an anti nutritional factor uh, improves the availability of nutrients in the feed, reduce uh, pathogen content in animal feces. And uh, biopreparation for plant protection from pests. Uh, Bioturin, asparagenic pest, biological insect uh, site for the control of the insect pest of grain, cotton, fruit, uh, and, uh, three, uh, and tree crops. Uh, description, uh, effective against cater, uh, caterpillars, uh, uh, this uh, in the presentation, you see uh, effectiveness of the, this uh, preparation. Uh, <clears throat> listed uh, phase of development listed in the register of biologics approved for the use in the territory of Republic of Kazakhstan. Biotox, uh, biotox uh, turin, biological insecticide for the control of insect pest uh, effectivity uh, against Colorado beetle and spider mite. Active, so, uh, active substances, crystalline complex, uh, beta endotoxin, and gamma endotoxin from Bacillus thuringiensis. Thuringiensis. <clears throat> Biofertilizers for plant growing, azotophyte. Uh, bioactivated biofertilizer for plant nutrition. Uh, effects improve uh, seeds germination, increase group yields, uh, strangers resistant to diseases and abiotic factors. Uh, Phosphatophyte, organa miner mineral microbiological fertilizer. Uh, effects suppress pathogenic microflora stimulates uh, root formation, increases the yield of agriculture groups to 40%. And for the time of 2019 and 2020, we uh, implemented the scientific and technical program, creation of biobank of microorganisms, cell cultures, genomics and uh, genetically engineered materials to preserve biodiversity and provide a resource base for biotechnologies. And uh, main results, uh, Biobank has been created from 125 production valuable strains of microorganisms and protocol have been developed for the in vitro conservation of explants for rare and endangered plant species. And uh, the composition of the nutrient medium for the induction of callosogenesis from the somatic cells of the dessert systems plants and the condition for the creating the suspension cell culture of the dessert systems were optimized. optimized. And DNA collection of rare and endemic onion species has been formed. And the nucleated sequence of the 
uh, chloroplast gene was determined in 52 uh, accessions of the Nedvetsky apple, uh, Sievers apple, the Ili barberry, and the Karkalinska barberry. An electronic database of biobank of strands of microorganisms, cell cultures, and hybridons recommended strains uh, produces of productive enzymes, antigens, proteins, and diagnostic significance, uh, DNA locus, uh, genetic construct, uh, rare and endangered, endangered plant species has been created. And now uh, we implemented scientific and technical program biobanking for rare and endangered species for flora and fauna for the conservation of biodiversity in Kazakhstan. Uh, problems needing solution, uh, decrease and disappearance of flora and fauna species. And uh, reducing the number of rare and endangered bird species and decline in the number of cygas uh, and expected results from this uh, program. Uh, the biobank of germoplasm samples, seeds, cultures of isolated meristems, cell and tissues of rare in, in the in danger species for flora Kazakhstan, including endemic medical plants under conservation condition and by crude preservation of at, at temperature minus 196 degrees has been collected. Technology for cell cultivation, tissue for conservation and reproduction have been developed for 15 rare and endangered plant species a biobank of DNA samples and database of chloroplast DNA, nucleotide sequence of 30 rare and endangered plant species have been created. A biobank of DNA samples of rare and endangered species of fauna in, of Kazakhstan and original biological samples have been collected from which DNA samples from 20 rare and in the, the endangered species of fauna has been obtained. Species uh, identification of 30 rare and endangered species of flora of Kazakhstan has been conducted based on chloroplast DNA sequencing and the use of informative DNA markers. Species uh, identification of 20 rare in indigage fauna. Uh, speeches of Kazakhstan has been conducted based on mitochondrial DNA sequencing and protein profiling by mass spectrometry. PCR test kits for speeches identification of uh, fauna of Kazakhstan have been developed to improve the effectiveness of the means against poaching. And electronic database uh, of biobank of DNA samples and biological materials and uh, rare and endangered species of flora and fauna of Kazakhstan has been created. This will provide an opportunity for all state bodies and environmental institutions of Kazakhstan to receive the necessary information. This is uh, some uh, example uh, of these results. Uh, for example, species uh, identification of rare and uh, endangered fauna species of Kazakhstan has been conducted based on uh, mitochondrial DNA sequencing and protein profiling by mass spectrometry. And uh, in this picture, this picture, phylogenetic tree for mitochondrial DNA of the common eagle all uh, buba, buba buba. Uh, a PCR test system for speeches identification of some uh, speeches of uh, uh, mammalis uh, on the 
uh, we see in this uh, picture uh, has been uh, non based on biological sample has been developed three primer spares amplifying fragments of the cytochrome B genes ranging in size from uh, 525 to 587 base pairs. Uh, mass spectrometry of protein profiles in Siberian raw DF bones. Uh, protein profile in three Siberian uh, raw DFs were obtained by mass spectrometry. Uh, reference library of peptides uh, sequences of the Siberian raw deer has been created on the basis of which these species can be identified. Uh, this you see protein profiles of bones of three individuals of the Siberian raw deer. Uh, this is uh, some uh, uh, examples of results of implementing this uh, program. And so, uh, Thank you. Ah, this is uh, amino uh, uh, acid sequences for collagen protein rare species in fauna. Uh, species identification was carried out using unique collagen protein peptides belonging to the, some uh, uh, species of fauna. This is of example of this amino acid sequences in collagen protein for uh, differentiation of these species by using mass spectrometry. Uh, in this slide, uh, results of publication productivity of our center. You see uh, in 2016, NCP was recognized as the most cited scientific organization in Kazakhstan. And uh, 2018, uh, was honored to receive International Scopus Awards Research Center of the IAEA in uh, 2020, and CV became the winner in the nomination, leader in the publication activity of the Web of Science Coil Collection for the period period 2017 to 2019 among scientific institutions of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. Please have a seat here. Uh, I would request all the speakers to please come on the stage so that we can start our uh, discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, house is open for discussion. Any question or comment, please. Uh, can we have Mike please? This one. Uh, in the meantime, the uh, online participant, if you have any question, you can write those questions in the chat box. Uh, it was really a uh, great presentation on the dead lights and I also working you know, on this aspect. So I have two questions. Did you ever choose monochromic LED lights for speed reading? Um, we have been using, but I think uh, those lights uh, still make us, people are using those ones uh, in greenhouses. But I think now people are just changing with these LED. And, uh, these are actually purpose-built uh, uh, lights. Uh, uh, I mean, the monochromic made a, sing a single light, either red or blue or green in a single way, not in the combination of red and blues. Um, not, not, I think, uh, because if we just put one uh, light, I think that will not give you the desired results because even in these uh, spectrums, you need to add a uh, uh, little infrared and also a, a little UV to cover up uh, all the uh, spectrum that gives actually out of that range 400 and 700 those in some crops that even gives the better results 
So uh, ever uh, used this one, the red and blue combination, because normally we use red and blue. And it was mentioned in your... uh, it's uh, both in there because if uh, you need LED with 100 LEDs, so if there are 30 blue and 70, 80, and uh, 5 infrared, 5, so it's combination like this. So you keep increasing. Um, if you didn't want flowering, so you keep increasing the red color and reducing the blue, otherwise, you need more blue and less red. So, so one last question did you ever apply this the pulse treatment of lights uh sorry the pulse treatment you are giving this lead light for a short time for few seconds at high illumination no and then it's uh, once your plants start growing you just grow them under these lights uh, so uh, not a flesh uh, thank you very much yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zahid Mukhtar. I have a very quick question with you. First of all, I would like to congratulate you that you did a great job to protect the cotton, which is really a backbone of our economy. I have very uh, short and quick questions uh, regarding the HVT genes and the other genes uh, you have developed. What do you think about their expression levels? Do you think like BT genes, cryotoxin is not properly expressed in our cottons, particularly in the uh, southern Punjab? Therefore, we are unable to control the insects and insect has developed resistance. Have you done any expression studies? If they are expressed, then what part of the plants, balls, leaves, twigs, where they are highly expressed? Thank you. Actually, expression levels, as you know, they are controlled uh, by the promote, promoters you use. So we have uh, uh, tried different promoters, uh, but 35S, as it has been used by different multinational companies, mm -hmm. it is expressing in all tissues. So it is the uh, basically uh, it is expressed in uh, leaves as well as in bowls, but um, its major expression or high level expression is in the leaves. And the problem is uh, basically uh, if you don't deploy a refugia, then insects, even if it is expressing at optimal levels, they can develop resistance. So the, at the moment, the strategy is to express multiple genes. But even that there are reports that uh, insects, they have developed resistance against multiple genes as well. Basically, the mode of action of these uh, type of genes, that is the same. So there is cross resistance in insects. So uh, that's why we have used uh, different uh, uh, technologies. And we propose that uh, uh, different mechanism of action uh, should be explored, genes having different modes of action so that the uh, development of resistance in the insect populations can be delayed. Last questions. Uh, what is the stability of the recombinant proteins produced from these HVT genes or isolated genes? Stability? Uh, they are uh, stable and uh, we have, uh, and generation after generation we have checked, they are stable, fairly stable in the field. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Tarek, on that. Assalamu alaikum. Th thank you very much for your good presentation to uh, Dr. Nibji Mukhtar. And Nibji has done a lot of work on GMO and uh, in OIC countries, Nibji is leading for these. So my question, I have worked on CAM on these insect resistant crops in my PhD studies uh, and uh, using different promoters. So my question, one of the question is that how HVT bind? to the insect, where is its binding site? It is targeting the nervous system. It's a neurotoxin. So it Neuro is basically targeting the calcium channels. Calcium. And my second question, uh, you have used two promoters, CAM35S and phloem specific promoter, which has the good strength expression? Actually, uh, uh, earlier we used uh, 35S promoter, but it was not uh, being expressed at an optimum level in the sap. So for controlling the uh, sap sucking insects, we expressed that under uh, a specific promoter. So the uh, 
uh, aim was different. In order to control uh, sap sucking in sex, uh, flowing specific promoters are better. But if you are targeting the chewing pest, then 35S promoter is better. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have also a question. You gave reference about an Australian spider species. Have you tried any local or endemic spider species for the neurotoxin against no, the have. insects? Sorry, we haven't tried uh, another spider as yet. Okay. How many uh, friendly insects you tested? Uh, insects in the, the cotton. We have tried all major insect species which are uh, targeting uh, cotton, like uh, army worm, uh, cotton boll worm, and pink boll worm, but you spotted know, boll worm. No, I mean, it's, you know, like bee is a friendly insect. It's not, it doesn't give yeah. harm to cotton. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So it, it targets only this specific uh, lepidopteran and uh, species. Uh, so you are yeah. sure. We have tried the other uh -huh. insects, friendly insects, they are quite safe. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my question goes to Dr. Nasser Saeed. As you have mentioned that we used uh, blue light and red light for different purposes for the different apparently growth responses. One of them is uh, the, um, the general growth and the red is used for flowering. And as we can see that uh, blue light is actually having higher frequency and lower wavelength compared to red light, which is having higher wavelength and lower frequency. So. Have you worked on the mechanisms that what 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 is what are the responses because apparently when you are giving stress in the form of higher frequencies to plants they should activate their secondary metabolism rather than promoting their growth uh, they should the uh, higher higher frequency or blue light or ultraviolet light it should actually um, promote defense response in them rather than uh, development or growth so have uh, I, I just want to have your comments on that and yes, we also experience uh, similar things because if we put them under this light, uh, uh, there are some necrosis on the leaves and like this. Uh, so we observe those things, but we adjust the light intensity accordingly by adjusting the height uh, and uh, intensity. So there is little manipulation in each crop. Uh, so yeah, you have to uh, you have you have to adjust them. So that's not uh, just the standard procedure that you have to follow for every crop. So we are this at the moment we are just working on wheat, and uh, another greenhouse is under construction that is exclusively for pulse crops. So when that will be ready, so we will try other crops as well. So far we have just passed few generations of wheat only. Our last two questions, Dr. Alabash. Okay. Uh, Dr. Zahid, thank you so much for your nice presentation. I have two quick queries. First is about pink ballworm. It's a very devastating pest. And HVT showed very good performance against first instar. This is what I said. Did you try the second, third instar or the fourth one uh, first and the other? What about its regulatory status? Have you applied for its field trials or still it's in lab? We have only tried the first instar larvae uh, because uh, the insects, they lay eggs and uh, once they hatch, they try to enter the bowls. So even at that very particular stage, it can uh, target the insects. So we have only tried the first instar. We haven't uh, actually uh, done on uh, later stages of the insects. So uh, regarding your second question, uh, what was your second question? Sorry. OK, we haven't applied for the uh, regulatory approval, no, not even for the feed trials. and. But we have uh, permission for doing the lab genetic manipulation work. So that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for all the speakers for interesting presentations. And then my question is to Nasir Said. Uh, 
Did you apply any uh, crop varieties uh, using speed technology? And if yes, for which crops? And uh, how many years spent to create new variety? And did uh, farmers use this kind of variety? Yes, there is only one variety released in Australia that actually used this technology so far. And other groups are still uh, passing through this cycle. Actually, this is uh, just a one step in developing a variety. Once you cross uh, a parent, and then you just uh, uh, pass on the generation just to uh, make your plant stable. I mean, uh, to segregation by following the single seed descent method. Other procedure is the same, right? I mean, once you, you do first five, four or five generations in the greenhouse, then you have to take it to the field. Some of the traits you can even test during this uh, uh, cycle of speed breeding, but otherwise you have to take it to the normal field trials. Then you can say that it's uh, this trait is there or it's expressing there. This process is just to speed up the first few uh, 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 generations actually thank you uh, thank you very much uh, with this i conclude this session uh, thank you very much all the speakers uh, for your presence here uh, ladies and gentlemen we will have a short break uh, we'll gather it at 11 45 and that session will be chaired by dr emery Aksoy and co-chaired by dr Labash. thank you very much The lunch session with one speaker followed by a group discussion. So basically, after this session, right before the lunch, we will skip the discussion part. We will combine the two discussions uh, in the uh, afternoon. So um, I would like to invite the first speaker from NIPG, uh, Dr. Wahim Khan. Uh, we'll talk about uh, on the uh, use of nanomaterials in agriculture. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, with your permission, I want to put off my coat because I want to feel light with it, like nanomaterial. <clears throat> Earlier, the title of my talk was use of nanotechnology in agriculture. Then I thought that we can also, or we also exploit uh, agriculture for firstly nanotechnology, and then how we can use nanotechnology for agriculture. It is give and take business. Here are contents of my today's discussion. What is Nanotechnology, I will briefly uh, describe there. Then how nanotechnology can be exploited for, uh, how agriculture can be exploited for nanotechnology and vice versa. Then what is the status of uh, nanotechnology in the Muslim world? And status of nanotechnology uh, in Pakistan and what we are doing here at NIPGI. Here, nanotechnology is the art and science of manipulating nanomaterials or materials at nanoscale. Nanoscale range is defined from one nanometer to 100 nanometer. This is the pet definition of nanomaterial. Any particle of any shape lying in this range of dimension is called nanoparticle. And nano is the uh, prefix of, uh, it is a, a one billionth part of a nanometer. When we move from micro to nano, features of the materials are changed and they exhibit different salient characters. Here are some people uh, who initiated nanotechnology. First one is the Richard Feynman, who gave the concept 
of nanotechnology in 1959, but he did not use the word of nanotechnology. Later on, the Japanese scientist, Norio Taniguchi, he coined the word, he used the word nanotechnology for the first time. Later on, uh, Eric Drexel worked a lot uh, on this aspect. And Chonglin Wang is Chinese uh, professor in USA. Uh, he is the uh, prominent scientist in uh, this area. There are a lot of applications uh, in every field uh, of science and technology, but here we will restrict ourselves to uh, agriculture. Here, how agriculture can be exploited in nanotechnology. We are in the dire need of uh, nanomaterials when we talk about nanotechnology when we want to start uh, work in the field of nanotechnology. Our first requirement is nanomaterials. And then we see how the nanomaterials are cost effective, how easily we can get it. Currently uh, in Pakistan, especially because we are working here, uh, we have to rely on very expensive source materials imported from outside from overseas and uh, not all the researchers can afford it. And we have to synthesize at very small scale for the research purposes. So there are so many other options. If we use those options, then we can get uh, high quality nanomaterials uh, using indigenous sources, which are easily available. Here comes uh, agri agriculture waste. Then we also use nanomaterials as source. Then uh, I will discuss about cellulose nanocrystals. These are the agri waste materials used as source. Then there also lies inspiration from agriculture, uh, uh, which use the concept of nanotechnology. Here are some nanomaterials we are currently focusing uh, in our lab. We synthesize silicon nanoparticles and then carbon-based nanomaterials, carbon nanotubes, graphene, carbon quantum darts, biochar and their composites and cellulose nanocrystals. Why do we use agriculture waste? Because they are cheaply uh, available uh, everywhere we are agriculture country so we can make use of those immense sources. Here we can get silica nanoparticles. Uh, silica uh, is silicon dioxide, and it has so many applications in uh, different areas. Here we can use different uh, waste materials like uh, bagasse and uh, peanut shells and with some treatment, we can get uh, silica nanoparticles. Then there are carbon-based nanoparticles, which include uh, graphene, carbon nanotubes, carbon quantum darts. They are easily obtained at lab scale using uh, agriculture waste. Then there comes biochar nanoparticles or biochar. And for biochar, we have to use pyrolysis uh, process. We heat up biomass or agriculture waste. It may be sawdust or leaves, rice, uh, cotton stalks, rice husk. And when we heat in oxygen deficit environment, we get biochar. If we heat up in the oxygen, then it will uh, convert into ash and we cannot use it for any further application. But biochar is very good material and we can convert biochar, which is highly porous, lightweighted material by some technique into nano scale biochar material. And later on, we can convert uh, this biochar by combining with some other materials to get composites, which have 
more applications, more useful applications. Here we have also uh, synthesized biochar composites with uh, magnetic uh, components. You can say magnetic biochar uh, composites. They are uh, used for different absorbing or was, uh, wastewater treatment applications and so many other applications. Here we have used uh, iron oxide nanoparticles to combine with the highly porous uh, biochar. Then immense source of cellulose can be used for uh, cellulose nanocrystals. This is renewable source. And using acidic hydrolysis, we can convert uh, cellulose into cellulose nanocrystals, which have immense application in uh, textile, in pharmacy, uh, in uh, paper industry, and so many other uh, areas. Here you can see the applications of cellulose nanocrystals. Then we can also use extract of the plants for synthesis of nanomaterials because we want to avoid toxic um, chemicals uh, which are used in the chemical synthesis route. But green synthesis is an eco-friendly or uh, less toxic approach in which we use uh, plant extracts. And these extracts are, are used as a capping agent, stabilizing agent, or reducing agent. If we don't use, then we have to rely on other chemical compounds. So we can use plant extracts for the synthesis of nanoparticles. Then, there is a concept of artificial leaf. Leaf uh, is obviously related with the agriculture. Artificial leaf uh, is a device, silicon device, coated with uh, some nanomaterials. Uh, it is like thin film, which we put into water under sunlight. Then this artificial leaf will split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is considered as fuel. In fuel cell, uh, it can be used uh, for production of hydrogen. And there are about uh, 500 uh, hydrogen fuel stations in the world. And hydrogen economy is very good concept. There are so many other techniques which are used for the uh, hydrogen production. Obviously, electrolysis of water uh, is very expensive because we have to uh, pass through electricity through the water, but it is expensive. So we have enough, enormous source of water and sunlight. How we can use sunlight to just split water under normal conditions. So here comes the invention of artificial leaf. If we put uh, this artificial leaf or thin film, uh, having coating of nanomaterials, and water splits under sunlight. And we get uh, hydrogen and oxygen, and we can collect uh, hydrogen for further use. This is the Daniel Nocera, US scientist, uh, who have invented this uh, artificial leaf, and he has practically demonstrated it. No, it has, uh, he has his own uh, company dealing with this artificial leaf product. Then, Self-cleaning surface, it uh, is in, in, inspired from lotus leaf uh, product. Here, there are many uh, glasses or uh, uh, fabrics which are called self-cleaning products, but they are based on uh, lotus leaf effect. Here, this is the lotus leaf. If we microscope microscopically see it, it consists of some nano structures on the surface. When we throw water on it, the drops roll over the leaf and the dirt particles are removed. So this was how agriculture can play role for the nanotechnology. Now we come to nanotechnology for agriculture. 
nanomaterials in fertilizer. There are uh, many nanomaterials. I have uh, just said about biochar. Biochar uh, is a good source for the uh, fertilizer. It can also be used as a uh, adsorbent uh, for uh, fertilizers and silicon dioxide. They are also used in uh, fertilizers. Here you can see different materials and which improve the soil conditions. There are uh, naturally occurring nanomaterials which are called clay. These are silicon, uh, the compound of silicon, hydrogen, oxygen, and magnesium. They are found naturally in our country and many other countries. So they have the features which can use for the enhancement of the uh, soil conditions. Here are nanoparticles mediated seed priming. There are some other conventional techniques or other materials, chemical materials, but here also uh, comes nanoparticles to play its role for the uh, seed priming. Common materials which are used for this purpose, these are uh, zinc oxide, carbon quantum dots, nano diamonds, iron oxide, silver nanoparticles, and so many other nanomaterials, which have been successfully used and they are effective. And then we are also working on uh, biosensors, which are used for early stage detection of plant pathogens. We are, our group works on uh, detection of uh, uh, disease, biomarkers, human disease, plant disease, and animal disease and so many other analytes, whether they are pesticides or others. Here we are uh, equipped with different equipments, but here I will uh, briefly discuss because uh, Dr. Sadia Zabrabajwa from our group will throw a light in detail on this aspect. Sorry, biosensor is an analytical device which has the capability for detection of an analyte by converting a biological response into a measurable signal. Here it consists of three parts. This is a reference electrode, working electrode, and counter electrode. We have other uh, biosensor facilities, but we will uh, briefly describe about electrochemical. Plot pathogens is an organic organism that causes a disease on plant. Here you can see normal tomato plant and plant with the, some disease curly leaf. Here you can see, this is chili leaf carb virus. And we have a nano-based biosensor developed for the detection of chili leaf carb virus. Here is the mechanism, because we have very short time, I will pass on. And here, this is the revolution. Nanoclay occurring naturally, they are converted into liquid, liquid nanoclay by just simple treatment of nanoclay with water. And it has converted desert into landform. Here, uh, nanoclay material have good efficiency for containing and maintaining water up to 65% for a long time. Here you can, you can see nanoscale structure of the clay helps to retain water in the soil. Emerging technology in Muslim world. Iran is at number one and number four in the world. Iran uh, has exported about 100 million products, nano-based products in the last year. And about 2025, they have the target of $1 billion export of nano-based products. Here you can see where our country lies. Here you can see some highlights. 
I have just explored on the net. Uh, Turkey has six companies, and I'm very happy to see that they are uh, manufacturing tabletop SEM. We are dire in the dire need of SEM, which are very cheaper and robust and uh, efficient. So scanning electron, electron microscope uh, tabletop features can be imported from there. There are a few industries in Pakistan who are using nano uh, materials. They are uh, textile and sports. Here you can see I have downloaded from the net. This is Masood textile. They are using nanotechnology concept. Here is our group. These are the facilities at Nipchi related with the nanotechnology. Our international collaborations, I will welcome international and national collaborators for useful collaborations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rahi. Uh, we will take the questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Okay, our uh, second speaker uh, is again from NIPG, uh, Dr. Asma Rahman, talking about designing 3D polymer matrices for controlled release of biofertilizer. Uh, is Dr. Asma? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to present my work here. So I will talk about the designing and application of 3D polymer matrices for entrapment and slow release of biofertilizers. As most of the researchers sitting here are in the agriculture sector, and you know better than me that agriculture is the backbone of many developing countries and the country, especially like Pakistan, our more than 60% of the population is reliant on agriculture for their livelihood. One of the challenge in agriculture is the overuse of pesticides and fertilizers. The main use of fertilizer in the agriculture is actually to provide a lot of macro and micronutrients to the plants that actually soil lag. So the world's agriculture is facing a lot of challenges and I have highlighted few of them like static crop yield, low nutrient use efficiency and declining soil organic matter due to excessive use of pesticides, the multi-nutrient deficiencies, shrinking of arable lands, water availability, and of course the lack of labor. So different researchers, they are trying in the world to overcome some of these challenges using cutting edge technologies, being nanotechnologists, uh, we are working on some of the projects that deal with the application of nanotechnology in the agriculture. And as you know that nanotechnology actually is working with the nanomaterials that, ha that have at least one dimension in the scale of one to 100 nanometer. So at such a smaller scale, the material, it has very excellent properties that uh, make them as an emerging and promising material to explain to explore their application in a wide range of um, uh, scientific areas. Like in agriculture, the people, they are trying to uh, manufacture different types of nanomaterials that inbuilt have the ability to improve the crop yield or crop growth. And uh, these, the same nanomaterials can also be uh, used to encapsulate different nutrients different fertilizers, different pesticides in order to uh, deliver these materials safely to the plant. So there are two main areas which we are working on is the nano fertilizer and the nano pesticides. In nano fertilizers, like uh, different, we are designing different polymeric structures and in nano pesticides, we are encapsulating them inside the uh, safer coating layer that uh, control their release. So at NIPG, um, our group is working on the application of nanomaterials in a wide range of 
uh, scientific fields like we are exploring their application in textile in biomedical science in environmental sciences but today i will highlight the work only that is related to the application of nanomaterials in agriculture so our aim is to develop the nano fertilizer for climate smart agriculture aiming increasing efficiency of fertilizer increase the uptake from the soil to increase the crop yield extend the duration of the nutrient supply so they, that they are available for the plant and do not waste it in the soil so thus reduce their loss rate of fertilizer nutrients into the soil by leaking so the general strategies which we are using at NIPG is include the encapsulation of fertilizers and biofertilizers inside the biocompatible polymer materials. We are uh, developing the nano size nutrients so they can be easily uptake by the plants. And of course, the, uh, we are working for the slow release of fertilizer, especially urea. For example, in this picture uh, lower, you can see this is the control sample. We have prepared this uh, highly porous, interconnected porous structure of the uh, different types of polymers. Uh, one of the beauty of such type of template is that they have a very wide range for any host molecule. So anything that is in the micro size can be easily entrapped within these porous structure. So we have encapsulated the different plant growth promoting rhizobacterium inside these polymeric structures. And after encapsulation, we have checked their release profile that whether they are release, uh, releasing from the polymeric structure so that they are available for the plant or not. So the detailed results will be discussed in Dr. Asma's uh, lecture that is uh, after me. Uh, I just uh, will highlight general strategies which we are using for preparing these like we are preparing the polymer beads uh, with the in situ encapsulation of the bacterial consortium that have the various uh, plant, promoting, um, plant growth promoting characters. And after encapsulation and polymerization, we are applying this, uh, these polymer beads to the plant and check their effect to, um, uh, to solubilize the organic and inorganic phosphate or uh, uh, how they improve the plant growth or plant yield and how they convert the nitrogen and make it available for the plant. So the other work uh, which we are, area which we are working is uh, the production of the nanoparticles coated urea. So as uh, all of you know that urea is the most widely used nitrogen fertilizer in the world, but in order to make maximum benefit from this plant nutrient, we have to understand its mechanism of action. So what we uh, did that uh, one of the problem with the urea is that the farmer that is applying urea to the soil, most of it is wasted. So only small amount is available for the uh, plant. The rest is uh, polluting the environment or the soil. So our strategy, strategy is to control the release of urea. So the slow releasing urea, of course, is an improved version of the conventional urea fertilizer. And it, um, it can be either produced by coating its surface with any hydrophobic nanomaterials, or we can make its conjugate with any other uh, nanomaterial that actually control its release. So whatever the strategy is, um, uh, like the main effect of the slow releasing urea, it's a general uh, presentation that if the plant is having the slow release fertilizer, its growth both root and shoot system, it grows well as compared to the uh, plants that are receiving the fast release uh, fertilizer. So uh, we, we are working for the urea coated with nanoparticles. And this is the general strategy that we are using. Uh, first, we prepare the different types of nanoparticles that have the ability not only to interact with the urea so that it can control its release, but also they, by the time they have the ability to degrade themselves. So the rate of degradation is equivalent to the rate of release of urea from the polymeric substance. And we are uh, using this um, spray technology uh, in which the urea beads are put in the rotating drums and the nanoparticles are continuously spray on the surface of the urea. As you know that urea is highly hydrophilic and it get dissolved very uh, rapidly. So we have optimized all the conditions so that the nanomaterials, it only stick on the surface of the urea. It doesn't disintegrate the beads 
of the urea and after coating we apply this material to the plants so another strategy which we are using uh, to control the release of the urea and these are the different types of samples which we have prepared and again the detailed results will be discussed by the dr asma in her talk uh, that like their effect on the plant growth uh, and all other enzymatic assay so in addition to this we are working on making the conjugate of urea with another important material hydroxy apatite so hydroxy apatite is a very well known alternative phosphorus source like besides its biomedical application um, it has been explored in the agriculture as a very efficient phosphorus source so it's a promising phosphorus nano fertilizer and why we chose this hydroxy apatite because it uh, has the ability to uh, reduce the solubility of the urea molecule so control its release to the soil and another thing is that hydroxy apatite is highly biocompatible and if it remains in the soil it increase its uh, or uh, it play the role of conditioning of soil instead of polluting it and another benefit is that it has a very high surface area so um, it is available for the conjugation of the urea molecule and make them available for the plant so these are the few results that are showing uh, that the coating of the urea molecule with the nano particles as you can see that as compared to the control there was a fair increase in the grain weight as well as in the fresh biomass uh, as compared to the control when we coat the urea molecules with the uh, nano particles and similarly when we make its conjugate with the hydroxy apatite its weight uh, both grain and fresh biomass weight was increased significantly so uh, the benefit of the slow releasing urea uh, there are many for example uh, not only they enhance the nitrogen uptake of the soil in parallel they also reduce the environmental soil and water pollution because they reduce the emission of the uh, different gases to the environment or uh, different toxic material in the soil so uh, controlling the release of the urea not only is benefit for the plant growth but also for the environment so based on the scientific data we can conclude that the nanotechnology can play a very important role in agriculture not only to increase the efficiency of fertilizer but also it can has the ability to increase the nutrient uptake from the soil uh, for enhanced crop production and it also has the ability to extend the duration of the nutrient supply so they are available for the plant whenever it is needed and of course it reduces the losses uh, of the fertilizers and ultimately it decreases the quantity of the fertilizer that is being actually applied for the plant growth in the soil so with this i thank you all for listening and i would be happy to hear you Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, we will go to the third speaker. We will take the questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Sadia for uh, for next talk, nanobiosensor for agriculture pests. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, it is very overwhelming and an honor to present our work at a prestigious platform where the scientists and the researchers, both from the national and international community are together. So I belong to a group where we are designing uh, nanobiosensors with the help of uh, biotechnology and uh, all the work, what we are uh, I am presenting here. Uh, it is with the help of uh, some collaborators from our own institute and from abroad. And uh, we have also used funding here uh, from our home institute, Higher Education Commission and International Foundation for Science Sweden. So as our mandate is to use and exploit different uh, properties of uh, nanomaterials, 
So here we are taking the advantage of the outstanding properties, not less than any uh, magic. Uh, and we use these nanomaterials to bind uh, the pathogens or the analytes and to design different sort of uh, biosensors. So uh, basically in a biosensor, what we use, we take uh, uh, synthesized uh, nanomaterials in our group. And then we use uh, different type of the biomolecules, enzymes, antibody, protein, nucleic acid receptor, and cell. And uh, um, by the interaction of these biomolecules with the nanomaterials, signals are generated. And these signals are then manipulated in different ways to assess, quantify um, uh, the pathogen, its nature um, for various application. And one of them is for the agriculture pathogens. Uh, several hundreds and thousands of the sensors have been reported in literature and in the market, it's actually a billion dollar industry. And, uh, but regardless of any type, uh, there is one heart of the biosensor that what we call as transducer. Transducer is actually the main component of the system and all the properties of a biosensor means how it is sensitive, how it is selective and uh, what will be the size it all depends upon the nature of the transducer. We take the nanomaterials and we uh, coat it on our transducer in a close proximity. And this generates a signal, which is then sent to the measuring ele electronics, which amplify the signal. And later different types of the softwares, whether um, in the form of an app on the cell or at the um, uh, PC, they are used to manipulate these signals. In our group, we are using five different types of transducers, which I, uh, I have uh, shown here. Quartz crystal microbalance, microchip, then two types of paper-based biosensors and very conventional microelectrode. So uh, each one having its own matters and demerits. For example, if we want to make a system selective, then we will use microelectrodes for the paper-based devices. Uh, we are having something that we can use that is very portable and we can use, and uh, uh, this can be used by any uh, common person. So, and about the nanomaterials, we have tried uh, nearly uh, every kind of chemical composition and uh, the morphology. And in the chemical composition, right from the neat graphene oxide, graphene oxide, carbon nanotubes, semiconductors, and uh, plain metal structures to their composites uh, we have investigated and their interaction with the, with the pathogen. And plus, uh, we have also used different types of the morphologies like carbon sheets, rods, tubes, etc. So for the uh, cotton, we know it's, it's a very important cash crop and uh, its production can be uh, greatly affected by co cotton leaf curl virus uh, disease complex, which is actually a group of uh, viruses that belong to the genera Bigoma virus. And uh, it is fast spreading and across the globe. So we, when we started work, we chose it uh, uh, for the designing of our biosensors. And uh, this is the microchip system, what I will show you later on. This system we faced with the help of IFS project. And this microchip, this has the uh, advantage that it is uh, very sensitive, plus it is cost effective that this chip we can buy even in uh, 30 to 50 rupees. So uh, we work with it. And then uh, we have also used and developed a lateral flow system for which uh, in the later my, uh, of my slides, I have uh, uh, prepared a very short one minute video in which we'll see how all these components work. Um, this one is the laminator where all the strips are, um, are uh, fabricated and these are pressed. Then is the printer, which prints all the components on the strips and then a, a programmable cutter, which cuts and prepare these. And this is the final shape of the, uh, of the strip, uh, what we are producing. Uh, at our group. So uh, as a proof of the concept, we started to work with the, the electrochemical biosensors. And for this, we prepared carbon nanotubes composite with copper nanoparticles. Here in the same, we can see the morphology that the strengths of the copper nan, uh, carbon nanotubes 
they are having the uh, agglomerates of uh, copper. And we prepared the material in, and uh, we established a protocol in a such a way that the potential on the nanomaterial is positive. Why to anchor and host the negatively charged strands? You now, what we, we want to use for the detection of our, our pathogen, uh, it's uh, DNA sequence. And so here uh, uh, we assume that when the strands are single stranded as a probe in the form of the probe, the amount of current is higher because now the current can be, like, can be passed through the holes uh, of the strand in the system. But when it forms the duplexes in the case when it is having uh, the chances of the complementation, then the amount of current is reduced. So based upon this, we assume that if in the case uh, it is, it is uh, uh, subjected to non-complementary sequence, the amount of signal is closer to uh, the um, uh, control signal. So here, this is very typical of a timogram. Here we can see the difference of amount of current between the capture probe and uh, when uh, we were having the Cochrane uh, virus Purevala stains a DNA sequence. And here from the amount of the current and its decrease, we associated and ascribed it to the presence of the virus. So when it was subjected to the increasing concentration here, we uh, obtained a proportional uh, uh, response and uh, we calculated the sensitivity. It was able to detect 0 0.01 uh, uh, nanogram per microliter uh, of the DNA. And here uh, in this, we have also studied the specificity. Um, here are the two types of the um, Cochrane virus and Cruel gene. And here again, from the amount of the signal difference, we, we related that the sensor was specific for only the sequence, what we are using as a probe. Uh, we uh, took a step forward and we applied this to detect the amount of virus DNA uh, uh, extracted from uh, the leaf. And here, again, from the uh, amount of the sensor uh, signal, uh, we were able to, um, uh, to detect and see um, uh, the, the infectivity as well. And after the successful um, uh, proof of the concept of this um, uh, probes and this electrochemical system, we shifted it, it to the microchip system. Uh, microchip was uh, uh, chosen uh, with the aim to make it portable with the, uh, with the cell that an interface can be developed just like a glucometer. And we can make an interface and we can drop the, uh, the, the leaf extract over it and uh, an app can be established, uh, uh, which can quantify us the presence of uh, uh, virus that it is present in the field or not. And it can be used as uh, uh, the early detection, uh, so to say. Here we used um, the strength of graphene. It's more conducting than carbon nanotubes and it's more flexible. So we assumed that when the graphene is uh, used uh, for the composite making with the copper, and nanoparticles, it will be giving the higher signal and higher signal means more sensitivity. And uh, the lower limit of detection, it means we can even uh, uh, detect the diagnosis uh, traces of uh, uh, DNA. And here we, we, we observed and saw that when the single stranded DNA is used, the conductance is lower and uh, net conductance. And when it formed the duplexes, then the response, signal response increases. So basically here we, we see what we were meant what to, to retain the flexibility of graphene. So from the control in the A to next, we can see that the, all the wrinkles, all the flexibility of the gra graphene was intact. Additionally, it was decorated with copper nanoparticles. And again, uh, the protocol was uh, established in a way that the whole surface was having here we have studied the charge potential as well. It was positively charged. So it means that the surface can be electrostatically used to bind our DNA sequence. These are the results. And this is very typical sensor response. And here we can see uh, uh, from the sensor response of complementary DNA and non-complementary a difference that we can use it for the specific detection here. And for the ch checking of the specificity, we use uh, these DNA sequences. 
And further, again, we applied it, the microchip we subjected to uh, the extract from the leaf directly. And uh, we can see that it was not only able to detect uh, the virus, but also different levels of the infectivity. From here, we can see that the different levels of the infectivity can be uh, observed. And then uh, we move forward to the lateral flow assays for a reason that these are specific and uh, especially user-friendly, rapid and robust and equipment free. Um, if we compare it to the conventional techniques of the PCR, uh, it's laborious, time consuming as well for the electrochemical and the microchip, but we have used, uh, it gives the response in, in, in some seconds because as much as the hybridization is available to the surface, to the microchip, it will give the sudden response. But sometimes it is important to use in the field settings. So for a common farmer, we, uh, we step forward and plan to make the strips for the use uh, uh, by, by a common um, farmer in a field for about this. And these are the different components. And here, what is actually uh, the strategy? This is the sample pad. Next to it is conjugate pad, then the nitrocellulose membrane and the adsorption pad. If the target DNA is present, um, in our sample, what we want to detect, this is the conjugate pad, uh, conjugation of the DNA uh, uh, with our nanoparticles. And later in, in this slide, I will show that what were the sequence what uh, we were uh, using, we are using uh, for this detection. And uh, here, the biotinylated probes uh, are conjugated and placed and printed on, uh, on the surface. And uh, what this, uh, they are designed in a way that they uh, are hybridized to the target DNA. It means that basically target DNA is taking uh, on the both hands uh, our conjugated probe and, and this biotinylated probe. And if the, this is present, then obviously it gives the <clears throat> red line, what we can uh, visually detect. In case of, uh, then another line is made that is captured probe and this appears when we have designed a separate capture probe, when the capture probe is, is only um, uh, hybridized with our conjugated one. And these are the different components. And we can see that for their working, they should be overlapped. I mean, uh, for each and every uh, uh, strip, uh, the design, especially the dimension of the strip, we have to optimize and we have to look for it. So this is the methodology, I don't go into detail. And these are the probes what we have designed for the alpha satellite and for the beta satellite. And uh, this is the methodology what we adopted uh, to make the conjugation of uh, gold nanoparticles with the DNA. We have also worked with the carbon nanotubes, but with the carbon nanotubes, we were not successful in getting the results. <clears throat> this is the procedure. Uh, uh, to prepare uh, uh, conjugation of biotinylated probe and uh, streptavidin. And this is the working of our... Um, this, is a, this is the cutter and this is the printer. What we are using to print all the documents I have described in my uh, we are discussing the gold uh, nanoparticle part of the nanoparticle. And this is the something of different components. And this is the nitrocellulose. And rain is already on it. And now, um, this is the with the candidate uh, pad.
so the main limitation for the LFA or all of this, this is the all the what we have shown in the uh, in the in the video. Uh, this is the summary of it that how we pretreat uh, our uh, a sample pad, pretreat our conjugate pad, then we dispense, and this these are all the dimension of our uh, the prepared strip. Then how we assemble LFA, and then the cutting of the strips as well. The main limitation what we face. Um, or, or any other person working with the strips is the uh, uh, optimization because a lot of parameters are involved with it. For example, what is the sequence of the DNA, how it will move through the strip, what is the porosity diffusion rate, uh, what is the ratio of the DNA and the gold nanomaterials and all that. One by one, we checked all um, uh, without going into detail. I'm just showing that uh, we, we uh, assess the salt concentration uh, we have checked the zeta potential to to show and uh, to uh, validate um, the binding of our DNA with the gold nanomaterials. Then the flow rate on the signal intensity detection probe and uh, the DNA with LFA. Still, it needs to be optimized further for at the point where uh, we can commercialize it for getting a clear uh, a red signal. Uh, obviously, then the probe fixers and such things we will. Uh, um, we will change. Uh, later to make it uh, uh, for the multiplexing, one of our student, um, she is working um, uh, 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 with a professor at the University of uh, Glasgow. Uh, uh, here we have shifted our multiplexing system to there. And um, this is funded by the IFS. And here, uh, basically, we have integrated the uh, technique of LAMP lamp with the multiplexing. Uh, all in, for every kind of biosensor, uh, the mainly important is how we are making the probe of DNA, what we will detect our target in the light. Now here comes uh, sometimes versatility, like for example, we can use the hairpin, uh, we can use CRISPR, um, uh, every DNA structuring techniques that can give us very specific probe the more is specificity is of the probe and more will be specific, the biosensor. And here we have used the lamp, uh, 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 the technique of lamp, and we have integrated it with, uh, uh, with the device. And this device that, that is able to detect uh, three DNA sequences, and this is for the control. And here, uh, what this is like a paper origami. For example, uh, it is in a fourfold, uh, the DNA sample, what we will, uh, we want to amplify, it is, it is, it is dropped here in the microliter um, uh, volume of about uh, 30 to 40 microliter. It goes to these distribution channel and it is uh, heated on a hot plate and then this, uh, divided into three channels. And then this cassette is whole inserted here. From here, then if the amplification occurs, obviously, if the target DNA is inside, then the amplification will occur. And if the implication is, uh, amplification occurs, it will give the signals here in the form of, um, again, the red lines. And this is another view of the same device. And here, these are the buffer uh, channels. And from here, it will move. And uh, here, the, uh, um, the red lines we can see. And a whole assembly, it is made uh, intact with the help of acetate paper. And here, acetate film to prevent uh, uh, the evaporation of solutions from the device. So this whole integrated device, again, it can be used uh, commonly for the multiplexing. So in uh, this is our LFA team uh, working in Pakistan, our students. Um, and uh, these are some of our uh, collaborator across the globe that are helping in different aspect of material designing. Uh, so in short, uh, we can detect uh, the virus DNA with the sensitivity and specificity, depending upon what type of the transducer we are using, uh, what type of the feature we want. For example, if we want the sensitivity, then we can choose the microchip. If we want to see the portability, we can go uh, for uh, the strips. So, uh, and further we can increase the specificity by, uh, by, in, uh, by making the probes in an innovative uh, DNA structuring ways. 
these can be fluorescent as well. Recently, we have started working on it that uh, if we are having a five or, or 10 rupees LED and uh, we use a fluorescent card and then uh, the um, we can observe the fluorescence and can relate it to the presence of DNA. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sadia, for such Thank a comprehensive you. and Thank insightful uh, talk. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Asma Imran for slow release biofertilizers using nanoparticles. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I must say uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to meet uh, international uh, community here. And uh, I will talk about development of slow releasing or coated fertilizers and its agriculture ap application. I am basically uh, from agriculture mic microbiology side and for this particular project, uh, I'm collaborating with uh, uh, Dr. Asma in the nanobiotechnology group and she is the Asma who is working on the synthesis of these materials and I am the Asma who is working on, for the uh, application in the agriculture side. So you might see some of the slides, duplication or replication of the other presentation, what she did earlier. So uh, moving towards the uh, <clears throat> introduction, a very brief introduction. Uh, everybody is talking about the uh, exponential growth in the population. And Asia is the region, the uh, ma major continent where the major population uh, uh, growth is uh, expected in the coming years also. And when we talk about Pakistan, we are the sixth largest nation in the world with 230 million uh, people. And uh, apart from this uh, huge population uh, pressure, we are also severely hit by uh, different extreme weather events that includes flooding, drought, uh, melting of glaciers, fire, and then the uh, rise in temperature. April 2022 was the, uh, uh, the hottest April ever recorded in the history of Pakistan. And all these, uh, the, the, all these uh, factors, uh, they, uh, and also the climate change, it is predicted that uh, within the next few years, the agriculture productivity in some parts of the world, they, it will decline up to 25%, while on other parts of the world, it will uh, increase up to 25%. And when we zoom into Pakistan, you see, we are among the countries where agriculture production is uh, expected to decrease up to 15%. So uh, agriculture productivity, when we talk about crop yield, is the function of crop genetic potential, amount of sunlight, water, and nutrients available for the plant, and the presence of pests. A lot has been talked about crop genetic potential and its genetic manipulation to improve uh, crop yield. I will only focus on the part of nutrients. Everyone knows that uh, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, they are the main uh, nutrients required for plant growth and almost all agricultural soil, they are deficient in both of these nutrients. And uh, to overcome that deficiency, the uh, fertilizers are applied, chemical fertilizers are applied and you see when fertilizer is applied, nitrogen and phosphorus both to the plant, you can see the plant growth is better as compared to those where the uh, fertilizer is not applied. So that means that the application of fertilizer is essential to get the optimum plant uh, growth and yield. And many of the uh, varieties developed in the background of green revolutions, they were uh, the varieties that uh, were highly responsive to the 
a fertilizer application. But for the past few years, uh, we have observed that increase in crop yield, they are not linearly correlated with the increase in the fertilizer application. That means the fertilizer which we apply, either it is going uh, wasted due to the process of eutrophication or it is being uh, volatilized or leased or uh, emitted into the environment by the process of denitrification. Moreover, the fertilizer use efficiency of many crops is very uh, low. And if we talk about specifically urea, the nitrogen use efficiency, it varies from 30 to 53% in different areas of the world. And losses, uh, they are too high up to 70%. And these losses, they are the major re reason for environmental and human uh, health concerns at local and global scale. So when urea is applied, uh, it is readily hydrolyzed and it is converted into ammonia. And if it is not immediately taken up by the plant, it will be wasted in the form of uh, uh, emission in the air. Or if it is converted into nitrate and nitrates, they are not readily uptaken, taken up by the plants, then these nitrates, they are leased down. So that means uh, the applied urea or and nitrogen release, they are not synchronized with the plant growth. So slow releasing urea, it uh, takes longer time to release nitrogen. It releases uh, uh, nitrogen, uh, which synchronizes with the plant growth and improve the uh, yield and minimizes the losses. And these uh, slow releasing urea, they are either uh, made by uh, coating of the polymer or nanoparticles or oils. And this coating, it reduces the solubility, hydrolysis and emission. In the market, no coated urea is available till now commercially. There are many products which are in pipeline uh, in, in the lab scale studies in different areas of the world, where you can see the coating with the polymer, with the biochar, with the zinc, uh, bulk zinc or nano zinc or sulfur coated urea. So the outcome of these uh, studies uh, show that if we coat the urea, it will improve the nitrogen use efficiency. It will lower the soil and water pollution reduce the emissions, reduce crop input cost, and improve carbon footprints. Moreover, it will improve the crop yield per unit area. So in our lab, with the collaboration of Nano Group, we have developed certain uh, nanoparticles and polymer coated urea. I will present some of the result from these uh, studies. So you can see here that, uh, I don't think it's, visible that uh, after 10 days of application of coated urea, you can see the, the presence of urea here in the field condition, but where the normal urea was applied, it was totally hydrolyzed or vanished, while where coated urea was applied, it stayed there in the field. These are just the result of 10 days. We uh, continued this for uh, the whole cropping season. And you can see where the normal urea was applied. Uh, this is the plant growth and uh, where the coated urea at different levels was applied, lower levels of urea, you can see the plant growth is uh, almost comparable to that where the normal urea with full dose was applied. And in case of 100 grain weight, you can see it increased from 1.76 in normal urea or uncoated urea to three in different formulations uh, of uh, coated urea at reduced levels of application. Similarly, we got similar uh, trend in wheat, where we observed an increase of uh, uh, in grain heat from 1.96 till 3, and in different formulations at reduced level of application of coated urea. So what we concluded from these studies that uh, application of uh, coated material or coated urea, it improved the plant growth at a reduced application level. That means it can save the fertilizer input also. Uh, it has also improved nitrogen uptake. We have uh, the data for nitrogen uptake. The plants with these uh, coated materials, they are having high nitrogen uptake and also the nitrogen use efficiency is high. We observed improved grain weight and yield per plot 
and uh, we observed very low ammonia emissions in this case. So it took uh, us around four to five years to develop and to optimize these things. And we are now in the phase of uh, second year field trials. The other uh, formulation which I want to discuss here, and this is again with the collaboration of Nano Biotechnology Group is the hybrid fertilizers, where we have exploited microbes along with the nanomaterials. Microbes, you know that in the plant rhizosphere, there are um, a number of beneficial bacteria. They are all already present in the micro, uh, rhizosphere. And these bacteria, they uh, improve the plant nutrient availability by fixing the atmospheric nitrogen or by releasing different um, uh, nutrients, uh, phosphorus, zinc, iron, or they also produce uh, plant hormones. So they stimulate plant growth and uh, improve root proliferation. And if the root growth is better, then plant will be able to uptake more nutrients and more water and plant growth is good. So we have uh, uh, included uh, uh, both the bacteria and the nanoparticles in a single formulation. I will not to go into the detail how we formulated these uh, formulation, hybrid formulations, but uh, as it is already discussed by Dr. Asma. So what we have observed that uh, we have observed that till 90 days uh, the bacteria they were uh, efficient we have just checked till 90 days but we have not uh, observed after 90 but the bacteria they were uh, you see the bacteria they were present on the plates that means the bacteria they are viable they are uh, uh, entrapment has not affected their viability and efficiency. They, were, they are able to degrade the polymer and the, the, as the polymer degraded, the bacteria, they came out and they were able to grow on the medium. And this is how these formulations look like. This is the confocal picture. The green ones are the bacteria giving fluorescence while this is the same picture showing the bundles of bacteria stacked upon each other within the grooves showing the bacterial survival and viability. So when we tested these bacteria after different time intervals for their plant beneficial traits, you can see they are able to produce uh, endolistic acid, which is a root stimulating hormone, and also solubilize different forms of inavailable phosphorus and zinc. And control con condition experiments showed that these, uh, these uh, formulation, hybrid formulation, they were able to improve the root growth they were uh, bacteria were able to survive in the rhizosphere and they were able to colonize plant root as well as to attach on the root surface. These are the control pictures and these are the fish pictures. And in the field, you can see the effect on the, the plant growth where uh, this is the control with full nitrogen without immobilization or uh, in, uh, normal urea. And this is the formulation with uh, nano urea, nanoparticles and bacteria immobilized in the single formulation, hybrid formulation. So you can see at 50% application rate, the growth is almost same. A similar result were observed in case of yield. And the bacteria, they also survived within these formulation in the field. That means the immobilization has not affected the efficacy of the product. So what we concluded of this, uh, that uh, the combination of uh, the bacteria and uh, nano fertilizers into single formulation has uh, maximized the benefit of uh, both the materials and uh, it has improved plant growth. It has improved the root uh, proliferation also and so slower degradation, it uh, uh, reduces the, uh, the stress on the bacteria and we are also doing field trials for those. Apart from these two uh, formulations, our group is also working on other options for reducing the emissions and chemical inputs into the uh, fertilizer, into the into the agriculture. So we uh, are working on development of biofertilizers and organic fertilizers. Biofertilizers are the product that are based on bacteria, and uh, beneficial bacteria, as I already told you, they are present in the rhizosphere. So these bacteria, they are being isolated and formulated and uh, checked in vivo and in vitro, and then uh, mobilized on the, some carrier materials. And these are two commercial products. We are uh, uh, selling it uh, to the farmers. Uh, one is for nitrogen and other is for phosphorus. And apart from giving nitrogen and phosphorus to the plants and in soil, these bacteria, they also 
improve uh, plant growth and root proliferation. And uh, also we have uh, prepared enriched organic fertilizers from um, uh, using, by using the agriculture waste, we have converted the waste, uh, uh, plant and agriculture waste and farm waste into, or dairy waste into the, the organic product and enriched it with bacteria. And all the benefit of all these products is that they are uh, ecologically safe. Uh, they improve the soil fertility, in, add organic matter to the soil, and uh, they are also low cost. And another uh, uh, aspect on which we are working for uh, development of biofertilizer is the tolerance of uh, stress and pathogen. So for stress tolerance, we have characterized and uh, formulated different uh, uh, formulations of uh, biofertilizer and we have tested these under natural stress, as I told you that April was, this April was uh, the hottest April ever recorded in the history of Pakistan and it has affected wheat yield uh, to a much extent, but where we have applied these uh, bacteria as the biofertilizers, we have observed that the 1000 grain weight, it improved from 38 to 42 percent, 42 gram. And also it has increased the yield per, per acre from 26 to 45. So that means that these bacteria, they are inducing uh, stress tolerance and also improving the growth of the plants under stress condition. So apart from this, we are also working on development of uh, uh, biopesticide or uh, pathogen control for pathogen control. And we have developed a product for uh, uh, control of pathogen based on trichoderma, which is a beneficial uh, fung fungi. So I will conclude uh, at the end that sustainability of future generations and planet, it depends upon reducing the chemical inputs and changing the conventional technologies with the more advanced technologies. With this, I will come to the end of my talk. If you have any questions, uh, comments. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Asman, for a very nice uh, talk. So now uh, we, we are well in time. So I would like to invite Dr. Waheed, Dr. Asma, both Dr. Asma and Dr. Sadia to come over here to initiate panel discussion. Meanwhile, I look at online questions. Okay, now stage is open for questions. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my question is from Madam Asma Imran. She, uh, she mentioned that agricultural productivity is going to be decreased in the future, but I'm uh, very concerned about it. Like we have been listening to the results and watching the results here. The research results are very uh, quite promising in increasing the agricultural productivity. But again, you mentioned that it's going to be decreased in future. Then why and which are, what are the evidences? that it's going to be decreased. It's not only the agriculture yield, but population is going to increase. So both should be increased. Uh, the agriculture productivity should be increased as the population is also increased. So per acre uh, yield should also be increased in the same uh, rate as the population rate is increasing. But when we see the statistics, we see that population rate is uh, growing exponentially while the agriculture yield is not gro growing or increasing at that pace. So we need to increase it more. Thank you. Moreover, there are so many uh, problems with the chemical fertilizers. So the Western world is moving towards using uh, alternative uh, strategies or reducing the chemical fertilizers. So if we reduce the chemical fertilizers, then the yield will also be uh, compromised. So we need to, to go for the strategies that can reduce the chemical input as well as increase the fertility and increase the yield. So, 
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Abbas Salim and I am lecturer in microbiology at Behar University of Health Sciences. Uh, my question is with uh, Dr. Fahid. Uh, sir, I wanted to know that what about the stability of carbon uh, nanotubes, uh, like you have developed the quantum dots. So what about the stability in seed priming? So for the stability, we can use different polymers, otherwise they may agglomerate. And definitely when they are not well dispersed or they agglomerate, then their nano features are uh, not uh, up to the mark. So for uh, stability or dispersion of all sort of nanoparticles, whether they are quantum dots or other particles, so we have to use some uh, polymer do, uh, so that they are well dispersed and uh, maintain their stability. So uh, have you conducted any field trials or how far uh, you have checked the stability during the seed prime? No, uh, we have not, uh, because uh, uh, we must know about the retention time. If, if you put for a long, long time, they may be settled down or agglomerate. When you synthesize, you prepare and uh, use them within uh, due course of time, then it will be more effective. Uh, one more question, sir. Uh, if you want to work on gold nanoparticles, so uh, uh, do we have any effective measures to which we can uh, make the gold nanoparticles from the waste uh, as you are using the bagasse waste? <laughs> no, no, uh, definitely I have, uh, uh, we have uh, good options, but not uh, gold. Uh, if, we, if we collect waste from uh, the shop of a goldsmith, we can use uh, those waste for the uh, synthesis of nanoparticles. Actually, we wanted to work with the gold nanoparticles, but recently- Yeah, I know you are lady and definitely you have the interest in gold. <laughs> Recently, like the shipment of these gold nanoparticles have been banned due to some issues uh, as we uh, have been working on it. So uh, that's why uh, this was the major interest. And uh, one more uh, guidance from this whole group as you all are working on the nano um, material, that if we want to collaborate or if you want to perform any technique like EEM or DLS, so how we can collaborate or perform the sample analysis, like our sample at your institute, what's the procedure? Uh, we don't call it collaboration if you come just for the analysis yeah. uh, for SEM and DEM, yeah. yes. uh, because we collaborate on equal basis. What uh, we see, what you can give us. Okay. So it should be on equal basis. Otherwise, you can come on commercial basis. Uh, definitely, we uh, perform uh, time analysis on the uh, 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 payment uh, at approved from our headquarter. Uh, I think it is about 4,000 per sample for TEM. And we have also uh, dynamic light scattering, uh, DLS for uh, uh, Zeta Sizer and so many other facilities uh, we have at NIPG. Uh, you can avail those uh, on the payment of um, uh, uh, the rates. That's fine. Thank you so much. Welcome. Okay, uh, there is one online question. It's from Abdur Rahman, and it's from anyone from Nano Team can reply. Uh, he, uh, he has asked that microbes also use fertilizers applied. Uh, how could these microbes improve availability, especially of nitrogen? Followed by, uh, could this work in drier areas with low rainfall and high temperature areas? Uh, should I answer? Yes. Anyone can answer. Uh, Yes, uh, the first thing is about the microbe also use uh, nitrogen, how they will uh, uh, make the nitrogen available to the plants. The important thing is the um, bacteria which fix nitrogen, they do not take the nitrogen from the fertilizer, they take it from the atmosphere. So you know, uh, in the atmosphere, nitrogen gas is up to 78%. So bacteria, they fix, they take that nitrogen in and then they fix it uh, into the plant available form. So they do not uh, interfere with the plant uh, applied fertilizers. They take up those uh, nitrogen and they use it for themselves also and for the plant growth also. The second question is for the, whether these uh, formulations can be used for arid or high temperature. I have shown you uh, in the last slide, I have shown you the result where we have applied these formulation for uh, wheat crop uh, during this April. Uh, where we have applied stress tolerant biofertilizers and we have not applied any uh, other uh, kind of stress by ourselves, but it was natural stress and it was uh, a desert uh, region where we have, we have applied those microbes. 
and uh, the control was without bacteria, uh, without bacteria and uh, while the other one was with bacteria and under natural high temperature stress i i, I already mentioned that this april was the uh, warmest april recorded in the history of uh, pakistan and uh, it has uh, severely affected the wheat yield in throughout the country so that means if we are getting a higher uh, grain yield and more grain weight that means the bacteria are working in those conditions okay thank you uh, thank you uh, first of all nanobiotechnology group of the nipchi is really working and addressing the real time challenges of nanotechnology in agriculture my question is from the whole panel if any one of you have observed and tried to experiment regarding the nano pesticide applications its efficacy its formulations how you can compare this nano pesticide formulation as compared to the uh, formulation available in the markets regarding its uptake regarding its stability and its efficacy anyone can please respond so for the nano pesticides we didn't compare yet in the field like it's a lab scale study but for the uh, biofertilizers like the madam was asking that we have uh, made the formulations uh, like for slow release urea or hydroxyapatite as a phosphorus source so we have done the uh, we have compared them with the pure like 100% urea and with the phosphorus fertilizer that is available commercially and check their efficacy according to that commercial available phosphorus like the results uh, she was showing that uh, if we reduce the um, quantity of the urea up to 50% and you couple it with the um, uh, nanoparticles its efficiency is comparable to the 100% urea um, given to the plant so for uh, nano fertilizers the stability studies is uh, in progress we have not yet uh, checked its stability for up to how much time it is stable the coating is stable on the on the uh, urea but for nano pesticides i, I think uh, it's just in the lab scale lab. study it's not in the field uh, let me explain uh, we use nanoparticles as carrier for the pesticides uh, in formulation as a nanoparticle as a pesticide we, we don't have uh, such particles which can be used uh, as a pesticide but for pesticides as a carrier yeah because for uh, for example um, silicon nano uh, silicon dioxide nanoparticles are used for entrapment of pesticides and with the temperature uh, uh, controlled uh, release of the pesticide. So in uh, this approach, nanoparticles uh, uh, like silicon or some other porous uh, materials can be used for carrying and uh, controlled release of the pesticide, herbicides, and uh, things like that. Thank you. I'm Dr. Sakib Nasir. Thank you. I'm Dr. Sakib Nasir from Ministry of Science and Technology. I would like to really appreciate the contribution of the NIPTI regarding the development of organic biofertilizers. As in my knowledge, uh, a couple of years back, NIPTI is involved to develop humic-based biofertilizers. Uh, my question is about that. Uh, everyone is uh, know the benefits of the organic biofertilizers and the uh, natural fertilizers, but why the industry is not uh, keen to adopt this technology? To replace the synthetic fertilizers in Pakistan, although this is a very smart uh, driven technology. I want to know about the comments of Niji regarding this question. Thank you. Dr. Shahid can uh, better answer this question. So, uh, regarding, um, you know, humic acid, you know, this has been uh, further uh, improved. And now this biologically produced humic acid has been tested uh, in collaboration of some industries. Uh, the problem is that you know we are competing with a very organized for biofertilizers. We are competing with a very organized uh, industry, which is uh, you know chemical fertilizer industry. So uh, I mean, so uh, it was difficult to convince that you know. So and now the way the way forward was that you know. 
the on one side and the temperature on the other side of the gallery to bridge the gap. So this is what we have done with the uh, you know working with FFC and Agro, which are the, some of the major stakeholders. I hope that you know by so they are uh, very keen on uh, you know uh, slow release fertilizer and, and nano fertilizer, and th these are uh, some of the success stories that you know we can decrease very much decrease the amount of chemical fertilizer by having this formulation. So I think that, you know, now the industry is listening because, you know, there's a lot of pressure from Europe from uh, and success stories from our neighboring countries. So I hope that you know, in coming days. Uh, so th there was a niche area uh, with, which I would like to mention is that, you know, uh, there's a demand for organic cotton. And uh, so the, the government and, you know, private uh, uh, this uh, also NGOs they have uh, worked a lot in developing uh, organic cotton or producing a, a organic cotton in Hindustan. So the, that was a very niche area where, where they are all, all recommending uh, nifty biofertilizers for, for for cotton. So this is a success story because you know there is no option of chemical fertilizer. So uh, that has become a success story, and we, in coming days, you know, they are asking to establish a bigger uh, production pl plant uh, near uh, Pakistan or in Pakistan. So I think that you know, that's that's the success that that comes. But obviously, you know, it needs a, a, a concerted effort to to uh, make sure that you know these products are used by. Uh, so. Uh, having said that, you know, there are now several industries, in, including Origa, uh, they already have a plant for biofertilizers, and now we are hoping that, you know, in, in a, a collaborative project, uh, we're inviting them to establish a, a similar plant in Faisalabad in, in our treatment. We have a land, piece of land in treatment, so I hope that, you know, the, the use of biofertilizer will increase in the near future. Thank you, Doctor. But I have a one suggestion uh, regarding this. We have a coal-fired power plants in Pakistan under the CPAC project, and the byproduct of the coal-fired power plant is a coal fly ash. Uh, and in India, that is a practice that uh, kind of biofertilizer plants are synchronized with the coal-fired power plant. I personally work for Engro at Thar and work for Saival projects. So my humble suggestion is the NIPG will collaborate with this kind of groups and try to establish some kind of facilities to provide the research outcomes that is based on the coal by uh, coal fly ash which is to be ultimately used at the plant site like uh, avoid the dumping of the coal fly ash and this and that i think that this is a viable option from the economical point of view so this I is would just like to comment on this uh, actually uh, one of our uh, earlier colleagues she is working with the angro and she has developed uh, her biofertilizer plant uh, with uh, next to the angro fertilizer plant so they are making coated fertilizer. Angro uh, is making urea, and uh, she is making uh, the biofertilizer, and then they are coating it onto the fertilizer, and then they are selling it with a different name. Uh, so similarly, we have also made uh, agreement with the Angro and FFC to produce and to coat their fertilizers with our biofertilizers. So in future, we will move towards the same direction as you are suggesting. So, uh, I understand uh, your comment as well. Yes, thank you. No, oh, thank you. That Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Dr. Fadil Akbar, and I'm working with the associate professor in, in the University of Swat. So my question is, is from Dr. Uh, Sadi Azafar. Uh, you have uh, used the uh, nanobiosensor for the detection of different uh, viruses. So my question is that there is a huge diversity amongst the uh, viruses, and uh, particularly the Gemini viruses. And there are more than 300 species amongst the Begum viruses. So how uh, did you? Uh, how can you confirm that the sensitivity and the specificity of the biosensor for that uh, particular viruses we can uh, we can detect? Because there is a huge diversity 
uh, only uh, more than 300 species in, in the single genus, the Begumo virus, and, and there are uh, 14 genera uh, amongst the Gemini virus family. So how can we can uh, distinguish uh, or differentiate that this particular virus or uh, genus, uh, particular species of the genus is present in that particular sample? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, for every virus, um, uh, whether it is um, they are diverse or not, there is always some sequences or regions that are specifically for them. So uh, what we say, the conserved region. Uh, uh, and uh, the other thing is this, as I told in my lecture, that uh, uh, different DNA structuring techniques we can use to make the probes more specific about that. So later, um, as uh, the virology group, uh, they they are working on the, these, although these probes that are more specific, uh, what we are using uh, for the detection of viruses. So if he can answer. Okay, now we will take the last question, then we will close the session. I want to appreciate the valuable talks of all distinguished scientists from NIPG. Dear panelists, nanoparticles can be synthesized using chemicals or plant extract. Does the synthesis approach affect the outcomes of nanoparticles in agriculture applications? Uh, yes, there are different methods to prepare the nanoparticles and your method of, of choice really depends that where you want to apply this. If you want to apply in the biomedical field, so you have to functionalize its surface accordingly. So in agriculture, mostly we are using the different uh, techniques that actually gives us the high yield because we have to apply it in the agriculture. So um, we are tuning their surface accordingly. Uh, it depends upon the application. Like in case of the uh, urea coating, we need a very smaller size and their hydrophobic surfaces so that they can control the release. So it all depends upon the, uh, your choice of application. You can change the functionality over the nanoparticle surfaces. Uh, so there is one uh, online question. How to industrialize the use of nanoparticles as on low scale, it won't be much useful. There are uh, nanoparticles or nanomaterials of different kind have huge potential for industrial application. And I have shown in my slides that uh, in Pakistan, although we are not exploiting in the true spirit uh, in Pakistan, but uh, I think the paint industry, textile uh, and paper industry, uh, and so many others, even in the sports industry, in hockey we have, uh, seen that nano tubes have been uh, exploited for uh, the enhancement of their strength. Uh, definitely, uh, in the world currently, there are about six to seven thousand nano based products in market. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, say that there is no work if it is not being done in Pakistan, but in the globe, uh, in all advanced countries. To the best of my information, there are about six to seven thousand nano based partially or fully uh, products are being uh, used. I have shown that in the Muslim world, Iran, uh, 
has produced so far about 500 nano based products. So in Pakistan, definitely we uh, have huge potential for the use of nanomaterials in different industries. Thank you. With this, uh, I would like to close this session. Thank you very much for all the speakers uh, discussing the um, applications of the nanotechnology in agriculture. So we have a lunch break and at 2.30 sharp, we will meet again here. Wrong. We'll talk about application of new technologies in crop improvement, plant, molecular farming, and protection of biodiversity. Uh, here. Okay, we start. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would like to first thank Comstech for inviting me and giving the opportunity to talk about application of new technology in crop, in crop improvement, plant molecular farming, and the protection of biodiversity. In parallel to classic GM technology, a wide range of new genetic modification techniques was developed for genetic modification of organisms, including plants, for research purposes or for development of crop for agricultural use. The real breakthrough in uh, breakthrough in genome engineering came is the design of nucleases that were able to specifically cut, uh, recognize, and cleave the target DNA. The first endonuclease was thin finger nucleases. These are, these are based on thin finger proteins, a family of naturally occurring transcription factors, but uh, fused on endonuclease FOC1. Second one was the transcription activator like effector nucleases. A fusion protein is a bacterial tail protein and the FOC1 and the nuclease. Similarly to zinc finger nucleases, target specificity comes from protein DNA association. In the case of talons, single tail motif recognize one nucleotide. So one nucleotide uh, when the Zinc finger nucleus domains recognize uh, three nucleotides. Disadvantage of zinc finger nucleases: uh, both of the uh, both of the nucleases, uh, both of the techniques developed based on these nucleases, uh, use it for genome editing, but. There are some disadvantage of this technology. Disadvantage of sing finger nucleases is that not all genome sequence can be used to, to create sync finger nucleases due to a limited set of sync finger domains. Second one is some sync finger nucleases have non-specific activity and they introduce breaks on unwanted sites of the genome. Third so one, the creation of finger, finger nucleases are rather long, laborious, and expensive process. Advantage of talents over the sync finger nucleases, they can be designed for almost any sequences in the genome. More efficient, high level of transgenesis, 
the level of non-specific activities is significantly lower. The process of creating talents nucleus takes significantly less time, is less labor intensive and much cheaper. Both of them DNA binding proteins. Therefore, protein mediated DNA recognition is difficult to manipulate. And the clear disadvantage of talents is they are significantly larger size compared to zinc finger nucleases. Also, genomic editing technologies using zinc finger nucleases and uh, uh, talents can generate genome modification new technologies faster, uh, robust, and uh, easier to engineer for our need. So uh, I am going to tell about the background of CRISPR technology. So CRISPR technology, CRISPR is a field, very young field. It's only really has been around since mid twenties when scientists discovered that a lot of bacteria have a repetitive DNA sequences in their genome that come to be called CRISPRs. An acronym of this stands for clusters of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. So what does that mean? That means just many bacteria have a distinctive future in the chromosome, sometimes more than one that, uh, that include repeated sequences shown by the black diamonds. In this cartoon, that flank unique sequence is shown by the colored boxes. And the three researchers, research teams in the mid of 20s noticed that in many cases, these unique sequences in the CRISPR arrays come from DNA found, found in, the, in viruses. So this was the first uh, identi uh, indi indication that this might be fact some kind of accurate immune system in bacteria. And the scientists also noticed that together with these arrays with CRISPR associated or Cas genes typically located nearby in the bacterial chromosome that turned out to be encoding proteins that part of this adaptive immune system. Science also found that uncultured, unidentified bacteria are very abundant with these elements. And so bacteria probably very actively using this kind of immune system to protect themselves from viruses in the wild. Later in the middle of 20s, the research group provided in evidence that CRISPR-Cas system specifically cleaves plasmid or bacteria page double-stranded DNA within the protospacer at specific sites. This research res results made able uh, a CRISPR use the CRISPR as the alternative genome editing technology. CRISPR is a unique technology that enables science to edit parts of genome by removing, adding, or altering sections of the DNA. The mechanism of CRISPR-Cas system genome editing contains three steps, recognition, cleavage, and repair. So this system to, uh, consists two key elements, two key molecules that introduce change in the, in the DNA. These are enzyme called Cas19, that acts as a pair of molecular scissors that can cut two strands of DNA at the specific location in the genome. So that bits of DNA can then be added or removed. And one or several guide RNAs 
guide RNAs determine target DNA specificity by sequence of complement complementarity. How does it work? A guide RNA, guide RNA is the cas nuclei, nucleus forms binary complex that specifically cleaves target DNA creating the double-stranded break. Cellular DNA mechanisms, non-homologous end joining and homology directed repair repairs the double-stranded DNA break. In this process, short insertions, dilations, nucleotide substitutions, gen insertion may occur. This slide demonstrates the number of genes modified using the CRISPR-Cas technology to improve the properties of agricultural plant species the last seven and eight years. It's, it's the pictures modified from uh, scientist Karatkova. You can see here more than 30 genes for rice and uh, more, uh, more than 10 genes for tomato, more than five genes for wheat have been modified, edited by using this technology. The next slide I am, uh, demonstrates the results of our work. You also applied this technology for potato genome editing. As you know, altered starch quality is a full knockout GBSS gene function in potato. Uh, it, uh, as, our, as a result of our research, the no, uh, full knockout of GBSS gene function in potato was achieved using this technology through agrobacterium mediated transformation and the direct regeneration from internal explants from domestic potato cultivars. As any engineer, genetic engineering technique, uh, the first uh, created the construct expression, which express Cas9 protein and the, the uh, guide RNA. You have tried edit one target site in the GBSS genome and also three target sites. Here I am giving the pictures of just <clears throat> one target site. The conclusion is uh, you have uh, got the genome edited monocout potato plants, uh, mutation, um, mutated plants, you have analyzed it using PCR sequencing and CAPS analysis. Sequencing reveals a mutation of single nucleotide in the form of substitutions and insertions and deletion around the targets, with the ADG and the GGG and the TGG triplet stacks as a PEM sequence. The method of color reaction is Yadin made it possible to determine the starch content and analyze Yadin complex in starch grains under the light microscope. It was found, it was found that uh, starch grains in micro uh, tubes is the modified GBSS gene turn reddish is shades from yellow to brown and the reaction of Yadin containing re reagents due the predominance of amylobectin in the starch molecule. So next section I'm going to talk about is the application of new technology in uh, plant molecular farming. The, in this slide, the cartoon is uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Canadian company, uh, Japanese farmers subsidiary, uh, subsidiary plant-based COVID vaccine uh, on the mass production. So new uh, molecular farming is a new branch of plant biotechnology where the plants are engineered to produce rec recombinant pharmaceutical or industrial proteins in the large quantities. How does it work? Uh, as any genetic engine, plant genetic engineering, the first you have to synthesize codon optimized gene of interest so 
genocide synthesized from viral sequence with no live virus here required after there is this uh, synthetic construct, genetic material construct, the genetic material should be int introduced into plants through vacuum infiltration in a uh, laboratory. You can use just uh, syringe is a small amount of agrobacterium which uh, encodes the uh, gene of interest. So it, the process needed the incubation, the infiltrated plants for three or five days for the protein expression and the virus like proteins formation. After that, the plant leaves need to be harvested and extract the viral like proteins. After, during the uh, like 10 days, one week, virus like proteins can be purified, need to be purified to obtain the clinical grade material. So it is uh, one of the uh, platforms for rapid, not just recombinant proteins, also for rapid vaccine production. Um, the, this is a platform, this is a technique is uh, very rapid, accurate, scalable, and versatile. Uh, next slide is uh, going to demonstrate some results of our work. For our research, we have used the tomato bichu stand virus genome for transient expression of recombinant plants. For that, the, some uh, virus genome has been uh, modified. So instead of capsid protein, uh, you have the introduced, uh, have been introduced the polylinker is a lot of restriction sites. This uh, job can be done, have, have been done with my colleagues uh, from Hermann Scholthoff in USA. The tomato bushustan virus, it is uh, uh, belongs to tomato viridae. It encodes five proteins. Uh, proteins P33 and P92 encodes the uh, translated from genom <coughs> genomic RNA and uh, are responsible for virus replication. A capsid protein, uh, it's translated from subgenomic enemy, uh, subgenomic enemy, uh, geno subgenomic genome two, genome one, and next the proteins, movement proteins, and uh, <clears throat> the protein responsible for suppressor of silencing P19 is uh, translated for subgenomic RNA2. So next slide is demonstrates the uh, expression, uh, expression of recombinant proteins by using this tomato bushustan virus. The advantage of the TBSP vector is that which carries the P19 protein. P19 uh, protein uh, helps to a, a highly expression of the uh, recombinant proteins. Uh, so here is uh, uh, the substituted the demonstrates this first slide is the GFP expression in uh, Nikachana bentamiana plants. Uh, so here the pictures shows you <clears throat> just agrobacterial in infiltration in a labor scale. <laughs> Next is you have also done the uh, is by using this technology, you have the expressed animal protein, glycoprotein, uh, GP51. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so plants offer a unique combination of advantage for production of valuable recombinant proteins in a relatively short time. The envelope glycoprotein, GP51 encodes yeah, envelope GP51 encoded by bovine leukemia virus is one of the essential subunits for viral infectivity. It was indicated that recombinant 
GP51 can be used as synthetic alternative antigen useful in the diagnosis of BLV infection in, the, in cattle. So uh, here uh, in this research, we have evaluated the potential for using viral vector based on the tomato tissue stand virus for ex efficient expression of BLV envelope glycoprotein RPGP51 in bentamina plants. So important for potential is diagnostic testes, purified recombinant GP51, specifically reacted with the BLV infected bovina sera, while the no reaction was observed with the negative serum samples. As a result, you have developed the ELISA for the quantitative detection of bovine leukemia virus in serum. So again, back for the hot top, the vaccines. Here's a, this slide demonstrates uh, plant-based human vaccines in clinical trail. So a uh, number of recombinant proteins have been produced in plants and the production uh, protein based pharmaceuticals has partially shifted from bacteria, fungi, and mammalian cells, cell cultures to plant and plant cell cultures. So it just intended for worldwide distribution in the nature uh, in near future of these plant based human vaccines. The next slide is demonstrated the uh, hot topic using, using this technology. Transient protein, transient protein production in plants uh, use it as uh, developed the new vaccines for COVID. So uh, one of the vaccines approved for use in Canada is uh, Medicago COVID-19 COVID vaccine that use it also this plant-based technology. So plant natural cells process is used to produce non-infectious virus-like proteins that mimics the spike virus that causes COVID-19. So your body immune system can respond to it in the same, same way it, it, if encountered in the real virus. So you can get a disease from this vaccine. Another vaccine is the COVID VLP advantage. Uh, O3 is a, one of the first plant-based vaccines that has been approved for human use and is one of the only small number of plant producing pharma, pharmaceutical products. So a last part of my talk, of my talk it is about plant diversity of flora, uh, plant diversity of Kazakhstan. The flora of Kazakhstan includes more than 13,000 species. For example, the, he grows the tree bush, uh, saxol, specific to Central Asian deserts. The wood of is so dense that it sinks in water. The also gray tulip, Petals which reaches 12, 15 centimeters. Also the famous blue Tianshan fire trees and the wild silver apple tree, which is considered to be progenitor, progenitor of the modern apple varieties. About 500 species are endemic. That means they can be found only in Kazakhstan, and uh, only in limited areas. For protection of um, biodiversity, considered several types of conservation. One of them is the in situ conservation. Uh, in their natural habitats, there are several strategies which are adapted for in Kazakhstan. The established natural habitats are national parks, national reserves, botanical gardens, nat national natural parks, 
natural monuments and the protected areas. To stop the continuous loss of plant biodiversity, the global strategy for plant conservation promotes the development of both in situ and ex situ conservation methods for rare and endangered plant species. Ex situ conservation of plants preserves them away from their natural habitats. So in vitro technology in plant conservation has been and remains an important technology. Micro, micro, uh, the micro, micro propagation technique for rare and endangered plant species uh, used for production of pharmaceuticals, genetic plant, for genetic plant improvement, obtaining the substances for secondary metabolism, for preservation of the gene pool, and the, for fundamental and applied research. He is, this slide demonstrates the, in vitro, it's the results of our research in vitro for ex situ conservation of a rare tulipa species. In this project, we aim it to uh, ex situ conservation of seven species to seven tulip species, uh, endangered and rare tulip species. Uh, so it, 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 in this slide, you can see the, the, uh, some flowers of tulip species is tulipa grega and tulipa turkestanica. So you have uh, inserted uh, in vitro culture, so developed the micro shoots and the micro tubers in tissue culture for, pres uh, for preservation of this species. You also aim it uh, during this project uh, in vitro ex uh, conservation of other five species. It is the uh, Cretaceous ambigia, Flaxinus sadiana, Sorbus persica, Junipers, and Eunumus uh, uh, copmani. All of the species are uh, endangered and rare species in Kazakhstan. So for all the plant species uh, was developed, the sterilization protocols, micropropagation protocols, slow, slow growth protocols, in vitro conservation and the cryopreservation. Next slide is uh, about the DNA technologies for plant diversity management. DNA technologies and applications to improve, improve our ability to understand and uh, protect global biodiversity. DNA barcoding is currently a widely used and effectively, effectively, effectively tool for identify plants quickly and inexpensive. Its application to specific identification and danger to wildlife allows enable researchers and consumers to make informed biodiversity management. The internal transcribers spacer and uh, of nuclear chromosome and plasmid sequences as matures, car, uh, as a five genus mostly commonly used for DNA, other DNA markers in uh, plant phylogenetic and DNA barcoding analysis. Uh, but they have been recommended as a core plant barcode, DNA barcode. You have also analyzed tulipa uh, endangered species using these markers. In this in this, yeah, in this talk, in this talk, uh, you examine the uh, phylogenic relationship in Kazakh tulipa species. DNA barcodes can be used to combat illegal wildlife trade. So last slide, 
the use of DNA technologies for plant biodiversity management, the demonstrators chloroplast genomes, tulipa alberti, tulipa greigi, and tulipa kaufmania, because the chloroplast are important organelles for most higher plants. And uh, the purpose of our research was our, uh, to analyze single nucleotide polymorphism and the singles, uh, simple sequence repeats compared to the chloroplast, of, chloroplast genomes of tulipa to identify the highly variable area to specific identification and to clarify the phylogenetic relationships of tulipa. Assembly and annotation of chloroplast genomes was carried out using the commercial Genius Prime uh, 2022.3 software. So next slide, I'm giving the titles of the ongoing projects in our lab and the, uh, one of the effects of P19 co-expression in the efficiency of targeted mutagenesis to minimize the accumulation of reducing sugars in potato using CRISPR-Cas technique. Second one, the genetic engineering of alpha-alpha plants for phytoremediation of pesticide contaminated soil. And third one is the creation of beer bank of rare and endangered species for flora or fauna, Kazakhstan for the conservation of biodiversity. Here's the my lab numbers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chuga, for your presentation. So now I would like to invite Dr. Ismail Mohammed Abdul Hamid uh, for his talk entitled Overview of Food Security Situation in OIC countries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I know that uh, always the uh, last uh, lecture, not very happy, and everyone wanted to, to see thank you and to go. <laughs> this is my attitude, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, today I'm uh, really uh, uh, being, uh, speaking about OIC and the, uh, the food security and the situation of food security in OIC is taking you out of what you are uh, really um, hearing for the last two days and what you will going to hear tomorrow, inshallah. And this is exactly me. I was also a scientist presenting gels and the DNA sequencing and the recombinant DNA technology. I am a molecular virologist. I'm a virologist in particular before I give up and moved to other uh, way because uh, I will tell you very frankly speaking that we have developed the new uh, with big team in Aguirre, Agricultural Genetic Engineering Research Institute in Cairo. And we, uh, I'm, I'm part of, it, of a team that to work in, um, at that time in uh, Butivaridi. And we uh, succeed to have uh, genetic modified plants that it is uh, highly resistant, very close to be immune to viruses. Then I'm totally thinking at that time, in 2005, that we need to have a good promotion program to uh, let the people, let everyone knows what is important to buy technology. Because we were working on this, we do it by our hand, but uh, so many people that we are facing in the media, they are against the biotechnology and they call it GMOs and they call it DNA, and as I, as I have mentioned. So, so the, the upstream coming from the ocean, it was even uh, uh, more than we can appear uh, in, in science and sun defending that we are uh, generating in the laboratory. 
So um, this is why I a little bit moved to be in, in, in the favor of how we can help scientists to deliver the message they are doing. So if we talk about the, uh, uh, the food system and what we really need to do in, in our member countries, we have to know that actually I came from, from Rwanda, from the capital Kigali, and I attended the Agra Forum for, uh, and it is a, a very big gathering in Africa because Africa is the uh, a continent that we are suffering from uh, food insecurity more than any other places in the globe. And we are also uh, suffering from different uh, problems, especially for those related to climate change, soil degradation, low and less productivity, and the, even the lack of the proper uh, uh, plant varieties, among others. So the situation in OIC, uh, Organization for Islamic Cooperation, which is 57 member countries, is very much differences from very high security uh, system to really fragile and need to be more resilient food system. So we do not, as all the globe have been committed to zero hunger just in seven uh, season of harvest. I don't know how this will be happen. We hope it happens. And we are under severe challenge with the climate change that we are all saying that climate change is coming, climate change is coming. And when climate change came, we said, oh, we're just in the beginning of them. We will leave to our kids to manage when it's more severe. And this is not the fact. We need to be more resilient also among this. So what we need is uh, what we need from the food. We need a nutrition, healthy, safe, and affordable food. And from, for, for us and for all OIC, we need it also to be halal. And the halal food now is equal to safety. So even non-Muslim uh, countries or non-Muslim uh, fellows, they are also follow the halal instruction as it is, uh, it is a way to ensure that the safety of the, uh, and the high quality that our uh, Muslims do for producing their food. So we need also a, a governance. We could not do food system without governance. And in IFS, we are, interesting on the training of uh, our uh, all agricultural sectors in OIC member countries. It's not only the 37 member countries for IFS, but all 57 in uh, OIC member countries. And for this, we had a, uh, a two days training for food security governance in Abu Dhabi last uh, May. And, and next week, we will have another round of training for uh, uh, MENA region and uh, some Anglophones or African, uh, sorry, Francophones in Egypt. And then in the beginning of February, we will have another round of food governance, food security governance for high level uh, officials in Abuja, Nigeria, try to covering before the end of the year, uh, um, almost uh, uh, more than uh, 250 participants in the justice three programs. So in this, we are also not only to uh, listen to each other, but also we bring a specialist from our out of OIC member countries, global uh, specialist to give us a hand on training on the governance of food security. So the situation in, in before the pandemic was disaster. And some of the countries uh, really uh, uh, feeling really, we, we feel with them that it is really, uh, maybe it, it will be more and the more. And this, this is what we can, we can found that in Afghanistan, the situation now is in, become more drastic. And of course, in Yemen, uh, Syria, they are also suffering from this uh, situation. So it was Yemen and Afghanistan and, uh, and the Syria sharing the most, uh, 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 um, the rustic situation in our uh, member countries. And this is uh, not only, this is before the pandemic. So after the pandemic, the assessment is really difficult. And this is why in IFS, we are developing a new program uh, regarding the uh, strategic commodities, trade and investment under uh, 
uh, crisis because I think, I hope it is the last pandemic, but science-wise we know that there is pandemic, uh, what we call it now an abiotic pandemic like uh, antibiotic, biotic like COVID and the others and the abiotic for those who is coming from conflicts. So we are all uh, globally now um, affected by this uh, situation happens globally. So this is what the new program we are developing in IFS also for how to, uh, to give a, a portfolio for how can we uh, mitigate the challenges of any new uh, food uh, insecurity can be happens. Uh, the situation for, for us as um, back to my entomology background that uh, the situation for transboundary best control under the pandemic was the most severe and the drastic in the history of human being. And it has been in 2022 because when the borders have been closed, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the interaction between the countries have been minimized if even uh, zero. So the chemical uh, pesticide change was almost zero. Then the, the uh, low cost from the uh, African Horn of Africa that in Somalia, Djibouti have been outbreaked and it have been uh, uh, very destructive to uh, Yemen and to go back to even the southern of Pakistan and uh, Iran. And it, uh, it is the effect of this, uh, it can be by uh, billions. Some of our member countries, all of them, they are now building um, uh, a resilient food uh, system. I just uh, mentioned here United Arab Emirates and the response of United Arab Emirates, uh, Emirates for, the, um, uh, for the pandemic was really remarkable because immediately they have, uh, they have the, uh, in February 2021, since the pandemic had been uh, announced, they, they have created or establishing the Food Security Council. And this council have been from all the governor, uh, uh, governance and from all the, uh, a, um, uh, uh, the Emirates. And then they have taken a, a very important uh, actions for them to maintain everything secure, everyone secured for food. Uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Also, uh, another, um, another system, I know that there is, every country have a wonderful uh, system that they have to do. In Bangladesh also, uh, they are, uh, they are, uh, was also suffering, but also they create a very comprehensive um, um, uh, food security system that it is, uh, it is the main, and the many committees, and they are all, under the uh, government, so and the private sector also is uh, participating in this one. And actually, they, they have applied this in early, uh, in late 1990s. And then I think they have also uh, uh, applied a, a, a sufficient system for uh, food security, institutional food uh, security. In uh, IFS, actually, we have uh, several programs and we are in this several programs, we are covering uh, almost all the uh, food security uh, uh, aspects. And I have mentioned about the five pillars we have. I do encourage you to visit the website of IFS and you see what the program that you can uh, really benefit of it and uh, how can you contribute and the support it's all use. It's, uh, it's, it's your organization. Go and you see how can you, uh, how can our program helping. Now we have a program for investment in agriculture. So uh, we have also program, programs for immediate action like humanitarian, humanitarian relief. And also we have the science and technology and innovation uh, programs that it is one of them. We are in, in biotechnology and it is, uh, we are cooperating in this program. So in this uh, gathering today uh, is under this program. So uh, we have program for climate change. We have programs also for st strategic commodities. And I had uh, the honor to meet yesterday, uh, as it's and say, Professor Golan, the um, chairman of the Pakistan Agricultural Research Center, who uh, told me that uh, they have 
the up-to-date technology of the DNA sequencing. They have it in, in the uh, other institute for National Institute for Biotechnology here. I think it is uh, very important for uh, our, uh, our uh, participants uh, out of uh, 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 Pakistan to, to know and to maybe coordinate with PARC Pakistan Agricultural Research Center, because they have this kind of facility that it is facilitated for, for uh, I think it is up to date technology and they have a platform and the servers for bioinformatics. This is not the only place here in Pakistan who have this technology. I think it's, the, it's also in Faisalabad, they have it and they have it in different places that I know or I, I do not know. I think the capacity of biotechnology in Pakistan it is very high also, so please the, uh, our, uh, our participants, our colleagues from outside Pakistan be, try to be uh, involved and to speak with the Pakistani scientists that we have here. So this is, will end up with the more hand-to-hand -hand and more uh, collaboration uh, projects. Um, so I think for food system, we have, this is the programs we have in IFS. I have repeated once and once again. And uh, as I told you that, please go visit our website and see, and this is my email. And I prefer always to communicate with email. Just uh, send me an email and inshallah, I will reply. If I did not reply for two days, then I'm in trouble. So uh, uh, once again, I um, thank you for coming today. I'm thanking Comstech and thank, I'm thanking the uh, Youth Forum in uh, uh, OIC Institute in uh, Turkey. I, I thank you, the uh, moderator, and uh, I wish to see you uh, next year, inshallah, with the better and they communicate much together. When I was young and I was uh, uh, invited to this uh, kind of gathering, I did not leave without a lot of correspondence and a lot of uh, cooperation. Uh, thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much. Um, now um, we can take some questions from the audience for uh, everyone who actually presented today. So now we will have the group discussion. Any questions from the audience here? Uh, and before you start your question, if you just can tell the name who you are actually asking the question to, that would be great. Okay, so my question is just like uh, random in general. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Basim Sajjad and currently working as assistant professor at National University of Medical Sciences. Uh, I'm also working as a public affairs advisor to Tent and Solution, which is a US-based startup and working on the river restoration and also on the climate change. So my question is like, what's the way forward for the IOC because Comstock is a platform which can go um, a platform to the young and the youth. Um, because I was looking for the way forward, like to, to dis for a youth engagement to discuss about the new startups. And also um, there are a lot of work done like in Pakistan and other country as well, but the young generation need, there's someone need to hold their hands and to guide them to the right path. So as there any mechanism on the, uh, for the next, um, I hope like the next slide will be a better platform for the youth, for the youth engagement as well, to initiate the discussion and, uh, and uh, other initiatives like what's the real problems of the youth, what they need and what they want. So that was my, uh, just an opinion and a question as well, like what is the way forward of the Comstack and OIC platform for the startups, for the seed fund and other youth engagement. Thank you. Um, I believe that we don't have any correspondent from the uh, ComSec right now uh, in the audience. We may get something from Dr. Ismail maybe uh, to see how the uh, OIC is um, trying to train or help the youth to elaborate their efforts in the future. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> this is a very good question. Actually, the answer is not with me now because I think it's uh, on a higher position. But, um, you know, the most important thing that to know, we are open 
and our hand is stretched. When we have good idea, we allocate funding for this idea. And uh, this is why, very clear why we are here today. It was a, a, a discussion, intensive discussion in uh, Turkey. And then we allocate this. So what we have done in, in what we are saying that this is the pillars and this is the programs, uh, then if any idea accommodated under this, it is ours. And we will take the responsibility to make it possible. Most important for us also, when we are in, in the participation point of view, look for the policies of the organization you are. So now in this, in, in this point of biotechnology, youth and education and the, all these categories, ComStack is there, IOFIS is there, and the uh, organ OIC organization for youth uh, in Turkey also, it is there. So this is why it was not difficult to, to gather all of them together. So when we tackle the OIC is always open, look at, go for OIC website and see how the policies they are looking for. They have for environment, they have for science, they have for social, uh, social sciences. So please go and everyone to see where you want to do, what you want to do, where you want to do and go, go cooperate. Now three countries together, maybe next year we will be maybe five or six. So uh, discuss with each other. Uh, um, we, we, for two years, missed the coffee breaks, we missed the lunch break, because this is the time that you can also cooperate and you can uh, generate new idea. So um, we are always open. Our emails is, is there and our website is, is, is there. And just, it is just for you to try to see how can you accommodate your ideas uh, and the innovation in what we are doing. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, one at the back, yeah. Thank you. I'm Dr. Muhammad Zubair Khan from Azad Kashmir. Uh, teaching as an assistant professor at the Department of Plant Building and Molecular Genetics. Uh, I listened to the important lecture from Dr. Shuga from Kazakhstan. And I have a, uh, a path just for my learning. She's doing great uh, work on different projects. Uh, Madam, would you please tell me, you mentioned some primers for biodiversity level management of some species, especially of tulip and so on. So uh, did you use some conserved regions for uh, the identification of a diverse uh, species? I mean, like uh, you use some primers, which are maybe I, I'm confused that whether they are conserved at the mitochondrial level or some other, because across the species, there are some difficulties or identification of different uh, genotypes. Thank you. Can we bring the microphone to the front? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. So you mean the, about the DNA barcoding? So for DNA barcoding, actually the recommended uh, the universal primers, uh, nuclear genome and the chloroplast genome. As I, uh, as I said, the ITS, ITS1, ITS2, and also the Cajun herbicide, and as a, uh, as a several three or like the uh, genes, gen regions, the, recommended use as a universal primers for barcoding of the plant genome. So all, all, all of the primers can be used to identify the specific regions and to identify uh, one plant, one plant species to, uh, from another. Also, here uh, sequence it for full chloroplast genome. So for tulip species, and uh, right now we are just searching the uh, 
yes, single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNP and SSR regions for, uh, to recommend as a identification markers. Uh, if there are any questions, we can take one last question now. Okay, it seems there are no other questions. Uh, so this ends uh, today's sessions. Uh, tomorrow we will meet again at 9.30. Thank you very much for everyone for joining us today. <laughs>